Welcome to this week's Into the Wilderness podcast, and unlike the last few, we are in fact in the same room. I'm back in Scotland. Yes. And it's been raining every day since I arrived home. It has indeed. It's not been the the best of weather since you come back, but I think, uh, well, we had one glorious day yesterday. (laughs) One day in a week. Anyway, yes, uh, back. This uh, podcast I recorded just when I arrived in Africa a couple of months ago. Uh, with Dr. Ray Janssen, who is the director of the African Pangolin Working Group. He's also a university professor. And we are going to talk about pangolins to start with, but this podcast goes from pangolins to rhino horn trade to ivory trade to grouse management, believe it or not, and upland birds in southern Africa. So it's really varied. It's a fascinating conversation with somebody who really knows what's happening on the ground. Well, there and you go. And... He's a very intelligent man. So like we often say, you know, everybody's opinion shouldn't be weighted equally because not everybody has the knowledge. Well, Ray actually has the knowledge about the stuff that he's talking about. So you need to put a lot of weight in what he has to say. And this is, in fact, uh, where the camera, uh, the wildlife camera traps went. And Yeah, yeah. so we cover that uh, sort of right at the end. He says a thank you to everybody who contributed in, in the uh, pangolin auction. Um, camera traps, thermals already out to them. We still have a bit of money left, which we're going to be sending some new equipment out. I think we actually talk about it in this podcast. I think it's going to be a um, an endoscope for seeing inside the burrows. Because one of the, <laughs> when I saw Francois uh, most recently, he was saying that he realizes how stupid it is putting his hand in burrows with a phone with a light on to see if there's a pangolin inside because there could be anything in there. <laughs> a honey badger. <laughs> yeah, a honey badger, a black mamba, anything that could hurt or kill you could be in that hole other than a pangolin. So an endoscope so that they can stick it down the hole to actually see without putting themselves in harm's way, I think would be a rather good use of the money. Yeah. And like we, you would have heard a few shows ago, uh, the decision was made quite early on that uh, the money wouldn't be sent. It would be just products, products, yeah. which is what's happened. And uh, I actually got sent the other day the first clips from the wildlife uh, cameras that are being used out there. Yeah, I need to. I, I should have looked at this before we started recording, but I think uh, Francois actually found a pangolin that they've been looking for for some time with the camera. With the traps. camera. Mm. There you go. So it's already working. Yeah. Um, this podcast, uh, as with oh, oh, the last six, seven, eight, I've kind of lost track now, um, we're doing in partnership with Modern Huntsman. Well, you've heard us talk about them probably for the last. 18 months, maybe More maybe not quite since, as well. Since before volume one, yeah, since uh, since the crowdfunding effort for volume one, um, Tyler Sharp, uh, who's the editor of Modern Huntsman, has been on many times, and we spent quite a bit of time with him in the States. And believe it or not, we are on volume four now, so there is a pre order for volume four, which is uh, an all female issue. We've got uh, some incredible. Uh, guest editors. You can't pre-order it right now, though. You can't pre-order it? No, oh, am there I, is not a pre-order. Am I, I'm, I'm speaking out of turn. <laughs> yeah. well, you, I've, I've wet their everybody's appetite. Yeah. You can't pre-order it, but the information The information about is it out there, but you cannot on. pre-order it right okay. now. Um, so you're going to have to... they haven't even got a front cover. So, <laughs> okay. they... so you're going to have to go and have a look, and it's definitely going to make you want to know when the pre-order is, and you'll hear it on the podcast as soon as it's available. But I know that the articles are being put together right now, and uh, the edit- I just got an email this morning uh, out to the editing team for the, the process over the, the next few weeks to get it ready for print. But volume uh, two and three, you can still get. There is only six copies left of volume uh, two in the UK. That's it. Six copies for sale. And now I've said this, I guarantee they'll probably, they'll probably all, be gone. They'll all be gone by the end of the by the time the show goes out and people listen in the first few hours. Uh, volume three, there's quite a few copies left of that. So uh, just the same as usual on our website, all the W's, the uh, for the world bar the USA. If you're in the USA, uh, order directly from Mon Huntsman because it will be cheaper for you. Yeah, but just strangely, it's cheaper to order from us if you live in Canada or anywhere else in or the South world. South America. Or South America. <laughs> so everywhere in the world but America, it's cheaper for. Yeah, and uh, I think well, since you're mentioning the States, big hello to our American listenership. Who have now officially overtaken our UK, UK yeah. in 
downloads. So hello, all of you. <laughs> We're great. Uh, we're grateful that you're listening to us from the other side of the world. Yeah, it's really cool, uh, and we have listeners in every single state. Are we now every yeah, state? Every state, yeah, every single state. So hello to everyone across the United States. I think we've had an increasing number of South African listeners. Yes, as well. we have. Yeah, uh, a few in Zimbabwe, and uh, yeah, we, we've had some really, uh, really cool geographic listens over the last few months. So we have the winner from our competition two weeks ago. So for the last few weeks, what we've been doing is we've been playing you an animal sound, asking you what is that animal sound, and then tying it to our competition, which, with regard to our partnership with uh, Modern Huntsman, has been to win a copy of Volume 3, Modern Huntsman. Uh, and Daryl, you have the winner. The sound from two weeks ago was a hippo. It was, yeah. Did anyone get it wrong? No one got it wrong. No, everyone got it everyone right. Everyone got I'm it impressed. right. I'm pretty sure everyone got it right. Yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah, so I've got a huge list of entries. There was a lot of entries on this one. And uh, this winner was from Instagram. I think the last one was from an email, but the, this one's from Instagram. And it is Few2005, um, and it's Doug Smith. That's what's written on the profile. Uh, so you guessed it right, and uh, congratulations. Yep. So thank you for that, and uh, contact us. And we'll get your, your copy sent out to you. I think everyone who has previously won should all have their Yeah, if, if you haven't got it, please message us. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone has got their, uh, their copies now. But just to make sure, if you haven't received it and you've won, then message us and we'll sort it out. Now, we've got another competition, but we're going to give the animal sound a break. We're not giving it a break. We're oh, gonna, we're not? No, well, that's a continuous you, you're thing. Gonna, oh, okay. Yeah, that's I a will, continuous clearly thing. Clearly, you can tell we didn't discuss this before we started yeah. recording the intro. Uh, we're not going to give it a break, but there's no competition with it. Okay. So you're still going to get the sound so people have the enjoyment of trying to figure to out guess. what it is. Okay, well, yeah. in that case, we're going to play the sound now, and you can tell us what it is. Okay, so that's just for fun, but we do have a competition. And it's not only to win a copy of Modern Huntsman Volume 3, but I had a call from a friend of mine, Rob, at um, Spartan Precision yesterday, I think when I was in the car with Daryl, and he phoned up. And basically his question to me was, if Spartan was to give 2% of their profits to a conservation organization, which one should it be? And I said to him, you know what, I don't actually know. Now, he would love to do it, um, he would love to keep the money in the UK, uh, and I couldn't really give him a good answer. Um, and so he suggested maybe we could mention this on the podcast and say, if there was this money to be given to a really good on-the-ground conservation organization where the money is going to the right place, where would you put it? Yes. So if you're involved or you know of, of something, then please let us know. Podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. And uh, it, it doesn't have to be exclusive to the UK. No, but he that's said he would the, like to keep it here. But that's where it would like to be kept. The company's based here, so it makes sense that but it, he but said, it but is a global company because yeah. they sell their product all over the world. I mean, the next thing he said was, if there just simply isn't a good suggestion, you know, he just wants to, to go to the right place. So the rest of the world, you know, let us know that too. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, but Because, you know, you might have organizations in the US or Australia or New Zealand that does a, a, you know, a proportion of their work in that country, but they might be doing other things around the world. No, well, I, mean, I think this is what an incredible initiative. You know, the, the, here is, a, I've seen their company go from inception to the success that it is today, you know, over the last, I'm not quite sure how long, five or six years, yeah. maybe maybe a little bit longer. Um, Rob has a great team. He's a great guy to have a beer with. Uh, we've in fact, had, we've Jenna, had his daughter, has been on the podcast. Rob's been on the podcast. And he's been briefly yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. But we did a whole podcast with Jenna Gearing uh, maybe 18 months ago. And we had a lot of uh, great response to that. Uh, and I, I wish more companies here would do that. You know, 2% of profits to conservation. What great initiative. So let us know your thoughts. And what we will do is the best suggestion that we, you know, the suggestion that, that grabs us the most. Uh, we're going to give a uh, javelin bipod, which is going to be donated by um, by Rob at uh, Spartan Precision, and a copy of Modern Huntsman Volume 3. Whoa. So that's an amazing prize. Big prize. So it's worthwhile yeah. racking your brains. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll stick some stuff up on social, or you can just fire us an email or message us through social media, but uh, there'll also be a post with regard to it to let everybody know the information and what we want from you. Yeah. So I am off to Tanzania in two weeks. That's exciting. Yeah. So I'm there for, I think, basically three weeks. 
I am there for, yeah, pretty much three weeks. And so it's not just to Tanzania, it's right into the interior. Yes, I am going to two different locations, and I even fly over the Sereng- Serengeti. Wow. So, it's going to be epic. I've never been to Tanzania, and uh, I was Googling plugs yesterday because I've got a universal uh, plug. But does your plug work? They take the UK plug. You're kidding me. Uh, they take the UK, and then also it's they take two plugs, the UK plug and then the big pin one. The round pin one? Yeah, the big, big, big one. Like from South Africa? Yes, oh, I think okay. so. So, Oh, you just take both? <laughs> yeah. Um, be- before we forget, we better give a shout out to our of patrons. Of course. Uh, so, pff, last few months, uh, we've been getting support via our patrons. Yes, we've um, just updated it, in fact. Oh, yes, you did that uh, yesterday. Due to uh, people just asking us. And there is now a greater spectrum of... Uh, categories to donate so now we've made one that is one dollar a month so that's less than a pound yeah uh yes it's one dollar a month and uh that means that you can that that's the minimum i don't think you can actually really go below that because the fees would outweigh the 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 dollar uh but yeah so there's now a dollar a month so if you uh like the show and want to support it then you can support it for as little as one dollar a month which is yeah, that's not even a quarter of a cup of coffee. No, it's not. you definitely can't buy a cup <laughs> coffee. of coffee for that. Yeah, <laughs> anywhere. Uh, but we've we need to give a shout out to our top tier supporters, who include Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman from RDContracting.co.uk, Chris Griffith, John Henry Pete, Tom McCraith, and the guys and team at South Esher Stalking, as well as James Marchington. So thank you very much, guys, um, yes. for being top tier supporters. Yeah, really much the- appreciated. The guys at South Ayrshire Stalking, thanks for sharing. They've been sharing a lot oh, of our been. stuff yeah. recently. So it's been uh, really cool. Yeah, you should definitely go and check out their Facebook page and their Instagram as well. They're really active on, on yeah, yeah, they've been doing a lot recently. Yeah. Um, I think that was pretty much all so I had. I've got so. a dog trying to yank out cables yeah, I can, here. I can see He's that. upside down. He's so upside how long down do you have at home before you're off to Tanzania? Uh, next week, that's it. Oh, so we actually we need to do some podcast planning so that we get all <laughs> yeah. that done before so you leave. I, I'm a, I'm away. Yeah, at the end of the week. Uh, but we were also there was a few people message us asking if when we can do some more UK, UK. Uh, stuff, that. and that is going to happen. It it just happened that we've been away, and the stuff we'd already recorded was from US and South Africa. Uh, now we're home and looking into December. I think that the bulk of the back end of the year is all going to be UK. Yeah, based it will stuff. be. I actually I know one that is definitely going to be coming up because Corin Smith, who's been on the podcast before, is talking primarily about salmon farming. Um, he messaged me while I've been away saying so much has happened since the last podcast. We should do another one, and I said to him absolutely. So I sent him a message yesterday. So Corin will be coming on at some point soon. I know that he's been really busy while I've been away, in and out of Parliament. A lot seems to have changed, and he's been doing the film tour of the Patagonia yes, film. Yes, he has, so he can tell us all about that yes. as well. So yeah, we're, we're going to get, not just Corin on about fishing, we're going to, we'll, we'll grab a whole bunch of uh, interesting people. I think we need to get a farmer on at some point that wants to speak, mainly because there's so much going on in the UK in terms of farming and uncertainty with, with Brexit, th- with Brexit and, and that kind of thing, and find out you know how it's going to affect them, how farming's going. I think we need to get something along those lines. Yeah. And I've actually just spent last few months taking pictures of sheep farming uh, so i've actually learned quite a bit about sheep farming over talking the last of few that months. it's a big international sheep dog trial just up the road from my house this weekend <laughs> yes it but is apparently there's going to be ten thousand people through there what's well, the world championships it's the world champs yeah i didn't realize it's the world that. championships yeah wow it, it's probably 15 minutes from my house <laughs> yeah I mean, we can see it from here <laughs> yeah yeah it's not i think i need to friday saturday sunday i'm going to try yeah, and go along it'll be it'll be pretty cool so if you are in the angus area of scotland the world sheep dog trials is on so and uh, Joe from Game Changer Barbecue and uh, our partner in the seasoning, he is cooking all weekend, I believe. So. Yeah, he's probably going to be using our the rub, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess so. So, yeah, in, in news on the shop, uh, the seasoning is back in stock. Uh, the refill, the refillable containers are, you know, the eight, the eight pounds fifty. But we've also got the refill bags, which are waiting. But I'm waiting on the stickers, and legally, you can't sell a food product without a label. So we're waiting on labels. So just be patient, and then the labels come, and then you can get the refill bags. Uh, coffee, we have a bunch of coffee that is currently reduced because uh, it's the end of like end of a batch, so it needs to go uh, before we can roast new stuff. So I've got two dogs fighting yeah, here. Yeah, just literally, me. Floki like, stuck his nose yeah. underneath the cable there and nearly <laughs> yeah. yanked the recorder off it. Uh, yeah, so 
uh, we've got coffee and it is, I think it's four pounds, four pounds, yeah. four pounds right now. So grab yourself a bargain on the coffee, four pounds. And I think you can order like three, four bags for the same postage. Cause someone yesterday ordered two bags of coffee and a seasoning and it was, the postage was three pounds. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah I think three, three, three bags of, uh, three bags of coffee plus probably another item and you can get it for the same postage. Yes. So if, uh, if you want to do that. Also, podcast t-shirts are now online for sale, which they weren't before. I actually thought they were, but they were not. So if you want to go and check out the... I was rocking a podcast t-shirt in Africa. I, I've been rocking podcast t-shirts as well. So uh, I, I really like it. It's really comfortable. So this podcast t-shirt is a, a bit different to our other t-shirts. It's a slightly heavier material. Uh, all the labels are custom as well. So it's got our you know our labels in them. Uh, so they cost a little bit more, but hopefully the quality is worth it. Because we spent quite a bit of time doing that. Yeah, quite a good few months just yeah. getting to the the final final place on it. Uh, I think that's I think that's all the the shop info. Uh, oh, Byron was talking about Volume Four earlier, uh, so it is not available for pre order for Modern Huntsman. But Byron said it is a women's issue. Yeah, and uh, You've I'll, got some I'll, just, feel I'll there, just read the first. Can we just put up a post. My about phone it has just uh, reloaded the page. So I'm just going to because the it's huge. So you, you go and read it online. But so Modern Huntsman Volume 4 is focused on women of the outdoors, led by a cast of female editors. Uh, this issue celebrates the accomplishments and stories of extraordinary gentlewomen in hunting, fishing, art, reaching, uh, sorry, reaching, ranching, and conservation. Sorry, I was being blind there. Uh, there goes on and on and on to say, but it's three paragraphs. So if you go on the Modern Huntsman website or our website, then you can read, it, all, you can read all about that. Uh, and probably I'm, I'm actually off to the States fairly soon uh, to give a talk at the CIC. Uh, and then I'm going to catch up with Tyler in the sort of last week of editing and putting this together, where I'll be sitting down with this amazing team of guest editors, which is going to be incredible. And while I'm there, I would dare say I will grab a podcast or two with some of the people who are going to be in volume four to, to get ready for the launch. Yeah, that would be pretty cool if we could get a lot of uh, like contributors well women on yeah yeah i know we're, we're like we're, we've been quite lacking in that it's just it's yeah. uh like the conservation shows. hunting space is very much a man dominated space um so it's going to be amazing to have an opportunity to catch up with some of the females in the industry yes yes it will be uh so is there anything else going on no i think that's it i think we should let people get into this uh incredible podcast with ray it's gonna open your mind i'm pretty sure of that enjoy Ray, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. I'm glad that we've managed to make this work this time because it, we were very close to grabbing uh, grabbing a chat yeah. when I saw you uh, two months ago now. Yeah, uh, but we missed one another. But I did get your um, your protege, <laughs> Francois, <laughs> Francois, up in uh, up in Limpopo, and we did a great podcast with him. And he enlightened the world as uh, as to pangolin conservation. And I had the the privilege when I met you of seeing one of the young pangolin that you're rehabbing. So I think that's a, a really good place to start. I want to dig into yeah. your background and what you do. But first of all, for those people who don't know, and for maybe those people who didn't listen to Francois' podcast, which they need to go and do, go back and listen to it. What is a pangolin and why are, why are you and I sitting down talking about them? Why is, it, why, does it, why is it a problem? Thanks, Byron, and thanks for having me on board. Um, yeah, for the last decade, it's kind of taken over my life. Um, I'm a, I'm a trained ornithologist, so I've moved from birds to mammals, so I don't know, evolutionarily speaking, if I've gone up or down, <laughs> but, but these things have completely in, in, engrossed my, my being. Um, so a pangolin, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mammal. Um, they evolved from a common ancestor, which is a cat-like creature actually in North America in the supercontinent Gondwana. And uh, they're the only mammal covered in hard keratinous overlapping scales, which is bizarre. Wow. So it, it's, it's a protein-based scale, just like rhino horn or people's nails. It, um, it's covered in these, these amazing uh, hard scales. And um, Asians have been using these scales as part of their traditional medicine. I've gone back 5,000 years, which I've got literature on um, in old scrolls and stuff, but probably 10,000 years. So it, it, it's it's a cultural thing, and just like rhino horn is a cultural thing, it's incredibly difficult to let go of your culture. And large volumes of these scales are ground into powder and uh, mixed as an ingredient into what well, we've counted sixty different uh, 
Chinese remedies. So it's part of these, part of this ingredient. So it's not just one thing that they're. No, not at all. In, in, in inverted commas, yeah. curing. It, it's many different things. It's many different things. Um, it, w- well over twenty different ailments, and then another ten to fifteen different spiritual ailments. But <clears throat> that study still needs to be done. So I need to get over there and and investigate exactly what it's used for, or they try and use it for. Um, obviously, we believe that there's no. Um, value in it whatsoever, but we have to scientifically prove that. So I've got a. a doc- but we, but we, we know that it is the same material as fingernails. Exactly. We and know that for a fact. The we, science shows us that. Yes. We, yeah. So we've, we've split out the amino acids of, of these scales, and uh, the, the building blocks are, are, are protein chains that are exactly the same as keratin and is keratin. Um, but the cultural belief is largely associated with if you look at lion bone trade which is basically taken um, place of the of the tiger tra- bone trade because there are no more tigers left it's it's the power of the animal it's a tiger then you take rhino it's the power of the animal it's the aphrodisiac related to its horn it's ridiculous so it's more like a sp- Spiritual connection it's to it rather, rather than, yeah. than something that's yeah, tangible. For sure. And if you truly believe that um, that smarty will cure your headache and it'll take it away, your brain is so powerful, it probably will. Oh, there's a massive placebo effect. You, exactly. So if you say, well, that, that this has got pangolin in it and it'll protect me from evil, which is a, 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 the African people strongly believe that um, because of its armor, you will believe that. So it's used here as well. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, so I should I should clarify that uh, yeah. Ray and I are sitting in South Africa right now near Joburg. So when yeah. I say here, I'm talking about not just South Africa, but the African continent. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I should have mentioned that. So we did it. We published a study last year looking at um, a whole lot of tribal communities that make use of pangolins and pangolin scales. And one of the big things is to ward off evil. So how do, how do they how do they use them? Is it uh, like black magic? Type stuff no, or? not really. It, it's not regarded as, as the as the dark part of the magic. We, we get two types of African magic. The, there's the dark side and the lighter side. So it's, it's part of the lighter side. Um, the dark side uses all sorts of weird and wonderful and horrible things. Um, that's pretty much black magic witchcraft, but uh, we won't go into that part now. But most certainly the, the, the scales are ground up. Very little bit used, not a lot. So it's reasonably sustainable in, in this country, South Africa. And it's ground into a powder, um, cuts are made on the forearm, and you rub them into the wounds. It's yeah, bizarre. And then it's, it's taken into the system and into the soul. Others uh, actually swallow a part of the scale into the, into the stomach, and it stays there for weeks on end because it's very, very hard to digest. Others, so they could just chew their fingernails. Exactly. <laughs> well, I told them that, and they said, no, it's not the, it's same. Not the same. It's not the same. Others, the, the one chap we were interviewing actually took a scale out of his top pocket and says, I'm bulletproof. Wow. I fully believed it. So um, then we did work in the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa, and they're also uh, used very, very um, heavily in cultural medicine there and also spiritual belief systems. So right through sub-Saharan Horan Africa, pangolins play a cultural role. But uh, that's never really been a main threat because of the small volumes. As of this year, as of the day before yesterday, in fact, I keep a log of the trade for the uh, – Government in South Africa, the National so Prosecution This Authority. is the, the illegal trade that they're aware of. Yeah. And we've intercepted 55.8 tons of scales leaving Africa this year alone. That's, that's 100,000 pangolins. So it's insane. And it's completely unsustainable for a, a poor creature um, that's um, solitary. Uh, they have territories and home ranges. Um, so they're not packed in a group and closely together. They're mostly nocturnal, um, except for the black belly tree pangolin. And um, they're pretty invisible. They don't make any noise. They they don't have any teeth. They don't have any removable jaws. They've got one hell of a long tongue that they suck up ants and termites. And they have one pup every one to two years. One? One. Every one to two years. So if you take, Someone asked me this the other day, and I yeah. said, I'm pretty sure it's only one, but I'm going to ask you when I see yeah. you. Yeah. So for the bigger ones, the two ground pangolins, because we've got four species in Africa, the, the, the two arboreal ones that cruise around in the trees, and the two ground ones, the Temic ground pangolin, which is about 10 kilograms. And that's what I saw. Yeah, that's yeah. What, that we, what you met. And then we, we've got the real ghost, the elusive giant ground pangolin that's about 35 kilogram animal. That's, that's a huge, big animal. It's huge, powerful and thing. where are they found? In the Central Africa, in the Congo region, um, not so much in West Africa. Their distribution is now really limited. They they hit hard from the trade. But you take a hundred thousand pangolins in six months, which we're sitting at now, uh, um, out of Africa, 
they 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 can't win the war. And do you have any idea how what kind of volume we don't know about? That's about eight to ten percent of so, what we find. So so you, so let me just clarify this. This yeah. that fifty odd tons is only ten percent of what we know is probably going out. So it's probably five hundred tons. <laughs> so a hundred thousand. That's insane. Yeah. A hundred thousand pangolins in this year alone is probably closer to a million. You don't have to be that good at maths to know the breeding rate. No, and the amount being illegally trafficked to yeah. know that. Yeah, and the, I, the 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 horizon for survival is for now sure. pretty short. For sure, and I'm really bad at maths, and I could work that out. <laughs> and and it, it's really scary. Um, and no one, you know, the world doesn't really know this animal because they don't survive in captivity. They don't feed in captivity. This is because of the way they eat. It's the way they eat. And it's strange enough, particularly in Africa's pangolins, we, when we rehabilitate them like you witnessed the last time you were here, um, you have to walk with them. Um, it encourages uh, when they dig in the soil and dig in termitaria to get hold of termites. It it's almost stimulates their appetite. When you keep them in captivity, they just don't eat. They do drink. They just don't eat. So we actually have to walk each pangolin uh, that we rehabilitate. And we've had 10 this year, um, five to seven hours a day. And when you've got three at any one time in our hospital like we had this month, that's 21 hours of walking. It's a huge amount of manpower. It, it's huge. And it's a huge amount of ants. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. We have to have the source of ants. Um, so we don't tell people where we go and, and, and walk the pangolins. Well, we, we, we're pangolin slaves, so when they wake up, we have to go walking. When they go to sleep, well, we put them down again. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we try and facilitate the rehabilitation process. But to get a handle on the trade, I can give you a, a story of how it came about recently in Africa, if you like. So, um, particularly in Central Africa and, and the areas you're going to visit in the next couple of weeks, um, pangolins have been used as bushmeat for many thousands of years. 80 to 85 percent of those people's protein sources bushmeat, wild animals. So, so here we're, we're just talking about literally the, the protein intake, the yeah. same as many other animals are used for bushmeat. We're not sure. talking about the scales. No, we're not talking about the scales. So, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, you and I and our forefathers, we, we would we would go and, and, and hunt for our protein. And that was our source of protein. It's a hell of a lot healthier than the, the rubbish we buy in the shops yeah. now with the, the hormones and stuff that spiked in. But anyway, um, in Africa, that hasn't changed. They're very In Central and West Africa, there are very few herds of goats and herds of sheep and herds of cattle. It's bush meat. Yeah. So because they, it is thick bush. It's, it's thick not, bush. It's, it's not terrain that no. is good for cattle yeah. and sheep and goats. It's tropical rainforest mostly. And pangolins are considered a, a delicacy. And they're, so, they're quite expensive when we look at some of the other bush meat. A large rodent-like animal is called a cane cutter. It's about a two and a half kilogram uh, um, rodent is huge. Apparently, it tastes delicious. It looks like I, a rat, does it? It looks just like a rat, but it's a really would, monster cane, rat. Would that be like a cane rat here? Very similar to a cane rat, just okay. the tropical version. Yeah. Ah. That's oh. very favorable. So, that's two or three US dollars for a, a, about a two kilogram cane rat. Do they taste good? I haven't tried one. I I'll probably see them when I'm in the DRC now, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but if you look at rodent, it's got very little fat on it. If, if, it must be pretty healthy, um, compact. And breeds a lot, so quite a sustainable time, source of protein. Has a litter of about eight or nine per female. Yeah, you know, so it a, makes sense. A, a, few t a few times a year. So, so that makes perfect sense. Um, pangolins are 20 US dollars if you want to buy one to eat. That's quite expensive. It's hell of an expensive for a person on average that only earns about one US dollar a day in Central Africa. Yeah, because I mean, well, that's like 15 pounds sterling for people at home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you imagine... You know, forking that's that's a lot of money. It's a serious amount of so money. Th so people must really, really want it if they you know, if they're prepared to pay that for it. I think at the the upper echelon mm. um they, so it's like they a societal are your, thing. Exactly. So it's a cultural thing. Say, come over for dinner, we're having pangolin and then you, uh, you wow. So, you so know, it the, can be a bit of showboating. I exactly, okay. yeah. And it it, it it you know, I was giving a lecture to my staff at the university here in, in, in uh, nearby in Pretoria a couple of months ago. And we've got a, um, a visiting professor from the um, uh, um, DRC in Central Africa. And she's an intelligent woman and she's a full professor and highly published. I put the slide up on, the, on my, my cover slide with a pangolin. She said, oh, those are delicious. So I didn't know whether to get angry or, or just let her ride. <laughs> But yeah, it's it, it, it's so easy to judge these things I, when yeah. you're outside. And she grew up with them. Yeah. So why it, would you think it's not okay? Exactly. Um, 
Western law says it's not okay. Culturally speaking, it's been okay for thousands of years. They've grown up with it. So what's happened now is um, Asia, in particular the Chinese, are heavily, heavily involved now in Africa. They're building the roads, the infrastructure. In many ways. Big way. Lots of mining going on. Plenty, plenty people come straight over from mainland China. And with them, they bring their culture. It's inherent. Um, The bush meat markets, when you walk there, you'll see piles of pangolin scales. It's a waste product. Completely, they've got no use for it, besides being somewhat traditional in terms of spiritual remedies and cultural, but they only use a very small amount. These Asian chaps will say, can I have those? Because the four Asian pangolins are stuffed. They're pretty close to extinction. Just from poaching? Just from poaching. And use for uh, medicinal purposes? And also a a, a delicacy, particularly in in Vietnam. So they're eating them there as well for meat? Yeah, 2,000 US dollars a plate in Vietnam. Huge. Wow. Yeah, work that out. A serious amount of money. So it's a very affluential thing, again, a status thing. So then the bushmeat operator will say, no, you can take it. It's a byproduct. It's waste. Because after the animal is killed, it's, it's, it's boiled in water for about two or three minutes to loosen it up the scales and descaled, viscerated, cooked on an open fire and sold. Then the bushmeat operator will turn on and say, how much do you really want those? Are you prepared to part with some money? No problem. How much do you want? Well, give me five US dollars. Done. Comes back again. He says, well, I've increased my price. I, I want 15 US dollars. No problem. It's still hell of a cheap compared to what they're paying in, in, in mainland China. Yeah. I won't tell you the price over there because it fuels the trade. But it's a serious amount of money. We're looking at rhino horn type of money here per gram. Now, the scales have become so valuable... They've actually overtaken the value that it that was originally for the meat and the bushmeat market. Now the people, who are pretty destitute people in mostly in Central and West Africa, are hunting them for the scales. So the commodity chain has, has spun on its head, and that's the scary bit. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of parallels between that and the, the rhino horn trade, which people are probably more aware of because it's talked about more it's in the media more I mean, that, that was never a meat issue the, the rhino horn trade had never had anything to do with meat but Correct. here we're seeing this flip on itself completely and i would i would imagine just guessing from what i know about it that that sort of economic drive yeah is now going to increase the illegal the illegal trade of it because whereas no it was question. probably a problem with the the meat trade yeah. to begin with yeah, this yeah. is on a different level it's on a whole and new level it's more money fuels more poaching correct and as, as the animal is harvested more frequently and more often just like we've seen with rhino and it becomes increasingly rare just like we see with drugs like heroin and it's driven underground um it becomes more expensive so as soon as you make it more illegal because under CITES rule um, it used to be appendix 2 some trade like rhinos appendix 2 yeah. you may trade it to a certain extent pangolins every single one is appendix 1 it's completely illegal you you may not trade in it whatsoever for any monetary value you can move it for scientific research but you can't trade in it so now it's gone right underground we find pangolin scales with rhino horn lion bone and perlamun in the same consignments so it's organized crime it never was see that's interesting because it's you know it's part of the be- the debate that i find fascinating um to try and understand a, a solution yeah where we see time and time again when you make something completely illegal yeah. like the drug trade yeah it doesn't seem to solve anything. No. In fact, some would suggest it could make it worse. Well, look at legalizing marijuana, which has been in the Netherlands for more than a decade now, some places of the States, just become legalized in South Africa. Um, it's not, not a big deal. Um, the, 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 the value has just crashed. Um, it's become commercialized. But, but it's, it's regulated. It's regulated. So, I mean, this... Uh, this, uh, we, I feel like we're getting to a point in, in, in the discussion with regard to this, with regard to regulated trade of yeah. pangolin, which I didn't think was somewhere we, we would we would get because it's not something I even really want to think about. No. But, but you know, so what does that mean? We know that the complete shutdown, which yeah. is completely illegal, yeah, yeah. Um, isn't working. No. Uh, would it make a difference if it was moved to uh, Appendix Two, where there was like regulated? trade? It doesn't feel like that would make much of a difference. I, I don't think so because it's a cultural thing and not so much a um, society driven thing like the drug trade would be. Remember, rhino horn is also somewhat a society driven thing. 
they make dagger horns and all sorts of yeah. other stuff, which is a, a symbolic uh, thing, a status thing. But when you go into deep, deep culture that is thousands of years old, you're on a whole different level. Um, there, I personally believe educating the youth is probably your strongest weapon. To take it out of adult people and out of their culture is extremely, extremely difficult. Mm. So, so we were, like we were saying uh, earlier, yeah. just before we started recording, it's yeah. <clears throat> if you imagine uh, as most people who who listen to this podcast are probably in the Western world. Sure, uh, you grew up your whole life knowing that a chair is a chair and green is green, <laughs> but if you're suddenly told one day that actually your entire life you've been told that a chair and it's actually a table and green is actually red, yeah. that screws with your mind just as much as telling somebody yeah. who for their entire life and all the yeah. generations before yeah. them, were, they were told that Reinerhorn did this for them or Pangler yeah. sc Scales yeah. did this for them. And you're told, yeah. well, actually, that was a lie. Sure. Try and fathom that. It's extremely difficult. And, and religion is on exactly the same wavelength. The Aztec Indians worship the sun gods. Um, each religion worships a different aspect. But you turn around to someone who's been doing that their entire life. And say, God doesn't exist. The, 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 forget it. It's not, you know. And if you, you can't change that overnight, you cannot change that overnight. You can change it with with p uh, people's age, education, and trying to change perception. But I don't know if we've got two decades to do that. And this is my this is my worry with a, with a lot, not just pangolin, with a lot of with these animal lot. wildlife yeah. conflicts yeah, yeah. discussions. I have the yeah. rhino being one of them. Exactly. Is that? Yeah, I agree. You know, education is 100% key, and you're yeah, right, yeah. starting with young people. But yeah. in, in places like China and other parts of Asia, yeah. that's a 100-year plan. Like, to change that, we're talking about multiple generations that we need to change I in completely the agree. I, I, and we don't have 100 years. No, we don't. So you're looking at three, four generations to, to try and change the culture. doesn't mean we're going to get it right. We may get it right in 10, 15, 20%. I mean, we've had um, advocates like Jackie Chan and quite a few Chinese celebrities um, come out and support us, which they've got a huge following. And I mean, that, that's that been absolutely wonderful. That's great. Yeah, so we need more of that. And um, But we still don't understand the dynamics of the trade, how much is actually moving out, what ports they're moving out of. Where they're being sourced, we know their hotspots. I, I know all the hotspots in Nigeria, Cameroon are two huge hotspots. Um, and in South Africa as well, uh, we had uh, you know 43 sting operations alone in South Africa. That was four times the amount we had in 2017. Um, so it, it's spreading like a, like a bad rash all through Africa. Um, and the price has increased as well. It's, it's increased... 300% over the last year. So in one year? In one year. So and is that because of the rarity of it or is it just because the trade is ramping up? It's because people have started to realize I can make a serious amount of money in a hell of a short time if I can find this thing and sell it. But here, here's a question. How are they finding it? Because so many people <laughs> yeah. who, I mean, my grandparents, when I told them that I was going to go and spend some time with Pangolin, yeah. they obviously knew what it was because they've lived here their whole lives, but they'd never seen one. Yeah, sure. My dad, who was born here, had yeah. never seen one. My mom had never seen one. Yeah. My cousins yeah. who are all from here had never seen one. Yeah. So it's not like you stumble over them that easily. Uh, very few people see. I've spoken to rangers, section rangers in the Kruger National Park and the eastern Lowfeld of South Africa, um, who've been working their entire adult lives, you know, three, four decades in a, in a habitat that's got a very, actually a reasonably good population of Temix ground pangolin. Never seen one. You know, nocturnal, solitary, quiet. Even with a spotlight, their eyes don't shine at night. They, They've got tiny little eyes. Tiny yeah. little eyes, yeah. And when they hear a vehicle or a person, um, they don't curl into a ball, they just lie on their bellies. But when they're in trouble, they curl into an impenetrable ball. So when that vehicle comes past or someone walks past, they're just lying down. And they got, they're got they the same color as, hard as, to see. as a piece of sandstone. Yeah, they are. Know? They are there. They are there, home range 5 to 10 um, square kilometers. So reasonably abundant. But so if you put the resources into finding them, which obviously these yeah. people who are trying to illegally traffic them are. And I know how they're finding them. So we in, in Peter Marisburg, which is one of the large cities in South Africa, we took a guy down last year with a pangolin in his backpack in a mall. Um, and uh, this was one of the sting operations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had we, we had info, he had it, an intel, and um, grabbed the pangolin. Uh, it was still alive, but it, had, it was too long in the trade. Anything two weeks and over, 
uh, if they're in the trade, they don't make it. So he had started to have organ failure and, and he didn't make it. But um, we grabbed this chap, sees his cell phone, scrolled through his pictures, and he's he's trained these Africanus dogs. This is yeah, yeah. almost an indigenous dog to Africa to sniff them out and dig them out. So there you go. That's one way. Amazing. Another way. And I can believe that because I saw um, Francois's dog will do something. You know, obviously, yeah. he's working with you guys. So exactly. this, is, this is to do with rehabilitation, but yeah. this is part of the tracking process yeah. to monitor them. Yeah. Yeah. His dog does the same thing. We've got our own canine unit. Huh. So we've got Belgian melanoids that are trained in all four species of African pangolins. And Annika Fave is our canine um, counter-poaching dog handler. She's flying over to Malaysia next week um, to go and initiate the very first a canine uh, pangolin detection dog unit in Malaysia. This is, is this to find stuff that's been illegally brought in? Correct. Mm. So Malaysia is one of the huge ports which, which uh, African pangolins that's gonna smuggle through. That's going to be scary. Through. Big, huge. So another way these guys are finding it, remember um, herd boys in Africa spend a large proportion of their youth um, in, the, in the bush. Herding their goats, herding their cattle. Yeah, they're there 24 hours a day. Yeah. So a lot of them don't go to school. That's what they do. And they see these pangolins. And remember, the pangolins are territorial. They, they, they've got their favorite little dens. They know where they are. You say to the herd boy, I'll give you 100 US dollars. You'll, you'll bring it to you that evening. Damn right. Yeah. When you've got nothing, of course you're going to do it. He knows where they are. Yeah. That a territorial pangolin, he's got his favorite little refuges. Okay, so he's not in that odd fog burrow. He's not in that porcupine hole. Oh, we'll go try his other one. Digs him out. So demand, trade, You've got to cut off the head of the snake, which is demand. You know, we've got how many anti-poaching units for rhino in, in this country? Do oh, dozens and loads. dozens and dozens. And across Africa. It's and across Africa. You, you know, it's just not winning. It's, and it's not going to win. Because we're not, we're not winning that battle, no. the rhino battle. No way. And Pangolin's going to be exactly the same. You've got to cut the head off the snake, and that's the demand. And, and one way is, is I've talked about the youth. The other way is we've just got to try and make it so damn difficult to ship this product out. But the crazy thing is that it's already illegal. Yeah, yeah. So huge. it's not like it's not like. Um, I mean, this is always the the argument with with the ivory trade. If you have a component which is legal, yeah, and then you have how do you tell the difference between the legal stuff very and the, the illegal stuff? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's very difficult. So you yeah. can kind of mask it in that way. Yeah, and fudge paperwork and what have you. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about a product from an animal which yeah. is completely illegal as it is right now. Yeah. So it's not like they would find it and think, oh, well, then maybe this is a, a legal component of it. You see. So how? Like, I mean, you can't. How do tell, you get around that? You you can't. Now now when we made it, CITES Appendix One. Um, the Chinese government were, were, were not very happy with the, with the ruling. So they, they said, well, you need to then authorize us to legalize our stockpiles while they were still Appendix 2. And that debate is, I don't know whether... So they've still got stockpiles? Oh, right? huge. Yeah. So so that I don't know if that's been approved or, or, or what the story is. I think, I think the stockpile has been approved. But who's saying now that the new stuff they're getting, they're just shoving on top of the stockpile? How do you exactly your argument? How do you determine uh, their stockpiles not new stuff, and they can put into their remedies? So to regulate it and to say, well, that's all, that's new. We can we can determine species quite easy from from DNA analysis. If you put an African pangolin scale in my hand, I can tell you what species it is. Um, but I can't tell you if it's new or old or or whatever because it's keratin. You chop your fingernail off, and Tutankhamun's tumors, <laughs> his nails were perfect. <laughs> You you can't tell how old it is. You no. can maybe carbon date it, but but that you know. So, just because you make it illegal doesn't mean you can take it out of the market, because it's been in a stockpile for for yonks. Um, the same with Malaysia. The same with Vietnam. Uh, they have stockpiles. Last year, Malaysia burnt close on thirty tons of stockpiled pangolin scales to make a statement. A bit like we burnt ivory. Just like you burnt ivory. Now there's the huge argument. Um, there, there's one thing about rhino horn. It actually can be harvested and it grows back every three to four years. That, that horn will grow back. So the argument is, well, why don't we just farm them and flood the market? And it, have a legal trade. And where, have a legal where it, trade. Where it doesn't make sense to poach them anymore because it's cheaper just to farm them. And I think it's an extremely good argument. I'm, I'm for it. Like I'm, with, with everything that I know and the people yeah. I've spoken to over the last few years. Yeah. The best conclusion that I can personally come to is that we need to at least investigate it and try it. Exactly. Because what we're doing isn't working. No. But like you say, this is a, a different scenario here because the animal doesn't have to die. You see, that was the point I was going to make. You know, as, as, a, as a population biologist and a zoologist and someone who cares about African wildlife and wildlife over, over the whole world, for that matter, 
you can farm the animals and flood the market. Nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, if you've got such a rare animal, and you can even offer the opportunity for a hunter to go dart it himself. Um, why not? Um, lion bone? No way. Elephant ivory? No way. Uh, and pangolins? Absolutely no way. They, it grows like a fingernail. So imagine plucking your fingernails out, you know. So you have to kill them to harvest the product. And that is the poor thing's demise, you know. Um, it It's just such a peaceful friendly loving i mean you they're, walked with that pangolin inc- it's insane i i have not been like emotionally affected by an animal for a very long time like i was i was not i said that to Francois yeah. when i did the podcast yeah, yeah. so yeah. i was not expecting it yeah it's why when i when i, when I met you and yeah. you took me um to where you're doing the rehab yeah i sat down on the ground with my camera and i said nothing for like 30 <laughs> 40 seconds i was got, just I've trying got pictures of you <laughs> i was just trying to take it in yeah. because they are incredible they bewitch you you under this spell. It's like looking at something out of the, out of the Cre- Cretaceous or Jurassic. It's what? What is this? And you humbled because they ignore you. They don't really know what a predator is. They're not, they don't really care. No, they don't care. I've got video footage that was taken two weeks ago in Londolozi, which is a beautiful game farm in the eastern parts of South Africa, a private place. And um, they were fortunate to see a pride of lions pa- playing with a pangolin. Huh. Pangolin just rolled into a ball. The lions were licking and trying to get into this thing, and they could salivating because you could smell <laughs> that obviously delicious meat under those yeah. scales. And um, after about three, four hours, well into the night, they they got up and walked away. They, okay, well. they couldn't do anything. I mean, that's a lion. That's a, that's a massively powerful animal. And um, you joined Francois when you were last year on. Um, W- w- one of the hunting concessions near the Botswana border. Yeah, we, great we, place. Fantastic place. Great uh, people. Wonderful people. You know, gave his whole heart, his whole farm, his whole everything yeah. to the concession. The whole family was invested It's in insane. Yeah. And, and I mean, these people um, uh, are just so passionate, you know. And, and these are the people we work with. And these are the people, um, the, the public on the ground, that, that I think one day will be the animal saviour. And we're busy at the moment reintroducing an isolated population of pangolins into an area, into a large po- province in South Africa where they've been previously extinct, we think, for two to three decades. And uh, we're, we're just poached out? Interesting thing. Poached, I don't know if we can use the same term. Now, this particular tribe, just like the Shona tribe in, in Zimbabwe, yeah, I know them, yeah. consider the pangolin to be the greatest gift you can bestow upon a leader or a chief. Okay. And Robert Mugabe got a couple of hundred pangolins on his inauguration in Zimbabwe, which are all dead now. Live? Live. So they're given live as a Given question. live. Uh, you take them out of their territories, take them out of their home ranges. They don't feed in captivity. Two weeks later, they're dead. The same happened in, 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 where, in, in where we are going to do the, the release now. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I don't want to tell you where it is right now because it's, it's a little premature. You're still, un- you're still undergoing, fair so, enough. So we watch them for three to four weeks to see whether they settle and, and, and uh, home into the new area. And then we'll do a press release. But we, we're not quite there yet. So we'll let you guys know. And um, uh, it's four now and, and they're really, really doing well. So they became extinct because of this gift-giving... Correct. Um, I guess uh, t- tribal heritage. Tribal heritage. So... If if you're a, a tribal chief in an area, you've got an immense amount of power because you can give land and you can give favors and you can bestow wives or whatever it happens to be as, as, a, as a cultural f- phenomenon. Um, if you are brought this particular animal, a pangolin, you, you, you are held in extremely good favor. So you may get land or you may get cattle or, or you, you, you may be bestowed a nice bride. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these are the, yeah. these, the, this is the reality of it. And it's, eh? so, it's so important that we try and understand these things. Yeah. Because yeah. only through understanding yeah. these little quirks in an area like that with a particular tribe sure. can we really get to the, we can the understanding. Of and manage it. Mani- yeah, manage yeah. it and understanding yeah. of where the underlying problem lies. Because yeah. like you correctly corrected me yeah. a minute ago when I said yeah. poaching, well, it, it wasn't. It, it's, it's something different it's to what we've just different. been talking about. Yeah, so I classify as poaching um, to be purely capital money driven illegal activity. Firstly, it must be legal. Secondly, it must be for financial gain. Now, in South Africa, we've got large, um, we call them muti markets, where they trade in... From Sangomas. From, yeah. So they trade like in... medicine men. Medicine men. Yeah. Um, 
plants that have med- medical value. They trade in animals that have spiritual and medical value, but we mostly powerful animals. Um, baboon, uh, um, you could look at tortoise shell, um, lion claws, a pangolin scales, southern ground hornbill a feathers, a vulture feathers. These are all very powerful spiritual animals. They are legal in South African law because it's a cultural phenomenon. So these markets are you're allowed to trade legally. Inside now, the borders of the country. Correct. There's two huge ones. There's Faraday Market and My My Market. What, so I could go to these markets? And oh, see yeah. It. You can go buy some stuff. Wow. I was there a couple of months ago. There's a full pangolin skin for sale. The problem is... The South African culture use very little pangolin scales. So they, they will sell one scale for about 50, 60 rand, which is a, not even a pound. No. Uh, two, two, three pounds. Yeah, two, yeah a couple yeah. of pounds, yeah. Um, so they move them very slowly. Okay. So there's the, the, the turnover... So it's not a container of 50 tons. Yeah. The turnover is so low that it's not an issue. But the chap from Hong Kong walked in there and he goes, oh, wow, I'll take that and I'll take any more. Yeah. This is and, not, and can you get me more? Yeah. It, this has now happened. This has now happened. Um, the other point I want to touch on, but as soon as you make those products for sale, for financial sale, it's not tribal anymore. It's not custom anymore. It's money driven. If you look at some of the Songormas and the Nyangas, which they call them in Zululand, and traditional healers, they give gifts, they give eggs, they give chicken, they give goats, they give sheep. They, 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 they don't move with a lot of capital and a lot of money. And, and when you, once you start putting a, a financial value on it, it's, it, it, you're moving out of that cultural realm. And the financial value has been given by the outside market. Correct. The market that didn't exist here on, the, on the continent of it, Africa. Exactly. So now we're seeing a lot of pangolin meat and scales going to the United States, to Canada. To the United States. To Why? Europe. Because, we're because of the Asian component that lives there. Yes. And the African component that lives there. Wow. So you, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. When you immigrate or you, or you bag a job in, in Washington or, or New York, you don't leave your culture behind. When, when, when South African citizens immigrate to New Zealand, New Zealand and Australia, which a lot of them do, um, they, they, they love their dried jerky bull yeah, yes. Yeah. You find the bultong shops. There's bultong shops in Edinburgh. Exactly. <laughs> you see. Yeah. And they want Mrs. Ball's <laughs> chutney. We, we have Mrs. Ball's chutney in Scotland as well now. You see? So, so you take your culture with you. You yeah. take your burrovors that roll yeah. meat with you. Oh, I love burrovors. Uh, uh, but the point is, we're seeing a lot of trade of pangolins to Europe. We're seeing a lot of trade of pangolins to North America. I am. Uh, it makes perfect sense now that you explain it. Yeah. But for whatever reason, I'd never even considered the yeah. trade to that part of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, China and India are huge emerging markets. Just like China, India also use pangolin and they harvest pangolin. There's an Indian pangolin, by the way. So, um, if you're looking evolutionary-wise, in Gondwana land... Um, Asia, uh, in particular China, Malaysia, Vietnam, w- bumped into the eastern seaboard of India. And the western seaboard of India bumped into the eastern seaboard of Africa and Gondwana, the supercontinent. So we were joined at the hip. And when mammals evolved, they radiated um, across these two continents. There were land bridges. So you get Asian rhino, you get African rhino, you get Asian elephant, you get African elephant. Yeah, of course. You, you get Asian lion, which is now extinct, and you get African lion, and you get Asian pangolin, and you get African pangolin. So one, they still have they still have some Asian lions. They do, but they're very rare. Yeah, uh, I was speaking to a guy last week who's involved with them. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and there's oh, not many though. Not many, and into India, there's still some in India as well. This is, sorry, this is in India, India. I'm talking about. Yeah, but they used to be full on in Asia, so they'd walk across these what I call conspecific mammals. They 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 very closely related, but when you eat all of them in Asia, you want the next best thing is their counterpart in Africa. So this is exactly what's happened. Because they're, they're basically running out of them in Asia. That, well, they have. They can't find them. So um, w- w- when your culture has a need for uh, lion bone, uh, Asian lion bone, you can't find them. Well, African lion bone will be fine, thanks very much. Lions are in huge trouble, eh? Like really, really big trouble. How uh, the, uh, the thing with lions, unlike rhinos, that when a, a lion gets poached, 
they don't, nothing is left behind. Nothing. So you don't, very often you don't know that it's just vanished it's from the bush. Whereas with a rhino, very often yeah. they'll find the carcass sure. days or weeks after. Sure, sure. But I, I know that this issue yeah. that you're talking yeah. about because yeah. they just vaporize. You yeah. don't know that they're gone anymore. Until it's too late. Yeah. Um, the problem with the lions are, you know, they, they were spread all over Africa, right up to s- s- uh, south of the Sahara. They are still up there, but they're few and far between in the tropical forest. Um, the populations that remain are in small, isolated reserves with inbreeding and all sorts of nonsense. Then you've got the whole lion breeding industry outside of reserves for the lion bone trade, purely. Because that's big. That's in South Africa. And it's legal. It's legal. And yeah. most of that is for the lion bone trade. It is all for the lion bone trade. It, there is no other reason. Sure, you. you'd... So you'd, we're talking... Just, I just want to paint this picture for people because I, yeah. I've, I've kind of... I've, I've not been there, but I've seen what it looks like. Yeah. It's basically a cattle farm for lions. Absolutely, and in a fenced-off enclosure, small enclosure, and the the buy, the the product that they're getting out of that yeah. is the bones and the teeth and the claws. Yeah. So essentially, yeah. it gets bred to a certain age, correct? Gets killed, yes, and then they, they I think they boil it up, don't they? They boil it up and extract the meat and boil it up, and they um, they get a quota from the South African government on on how many kilograms you're you're allowed to sell per person. Um, they, they, there's a huge favour for uh, skin for trophy heads, for um, the claws and the bones. So you sell everything. And it's immensely profitable because there's a huge demand because it's a cultural thing. So, But, but a, lot of, a lot of this is going outside the country. It's yeah. all exported, all 100%, exported. 100%. So here's an interesting question about this. I mean, it, it feels completely unpalatable to me to even think about this you know, mass breeding. Yeah. And I've seen the pictures of like, yeah, yeah. most of them are kept in pretty shitty circumstances. Yeah, and in grasslands, which isn't even lion habitat. Yeah. yeah. But let's say that uh, the animal welfare of those animals was good. Yeah. If it, let's just assume that it, it was okay. good for a moment. Sure. And this was a legal trade, which it currently is for yeah. lion birds. Yeah. Is it better to do that and remove the, the desire um, to poach wild lions? I don't know if yeah. I have an answer to that. It's a, it's a, it's, like, it's yeah. one of these sort of moral dilemmas. It, it, there's no clear-cut answer. The only problem with that, you know, when you look at the captive lion trade, they're held in such close quarters that those lion cubs are petted as well. So they, they imprint well, it to humans. This is the interesting thing when you talk about yeah. wildlife exploitation, because some yeah. of these lions that are used for wildlife tourism yeah. come and take, pay your however many dollars to pet a cub. They're the same ones that... It turns into lion bones at the end of the day. Every single one of them, without exception. And people don't know this. No, no. And, and you know, when I, I'm not in that... Um, it's not a focus of my research. I, I, I think if I work on too many endangered species, I'm going to become an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very depressing. It's extremely depressing because we lose more than we win. So, you know, once you've lost a couple and they die in your arms, you, you kind of freak out and, and you say, I can't do it anymore. So you withdraw and then... You got to get back into it because if 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 I don't do it, who's going to do it? You know that's how I started the African Pangolin Working Group in 2011 because it, nobody was doing it, nothing. Um, now the IUCN Species Survival Commission Pangolin Specialist Group, which I'm also a member of, is is doing fantastic work. They were launched in 2012, um, but. If you look at the line industry, you make a huge amount of money from overseas tourists that would love to hold a lion cub. I mean, they're, they're, they're stunning little things, you know. They're incredible. They're, incredible. they're imprinted, yeah. and then they get bigger and bigger. And, um, you, you know, they just supply this this huge, huge demand. Um, and it's a very dishonest approach from a lot of these operators. Uh, it's completely they're, they're, they're National Geographic this yeah, month yeah, yeah. put a big... I, I, I haven't finished reading it yet, and so I'm not quite sure if there was much to do with Africa. Most of it, I think, was focused on Asia. Yeah, yeah. With, with elephants and yeah. tigers yeah. and bears in and, and Russia. Sure. Um, but the same is true here, exactly yeah. what we're talking yeah. about. And it's. I mean, if you look at the movie that the, the same guys who were working on the documentary that we were, that they came and shot a few, some of us in the field called Eye of the Pangolin, that's sort of trending on, on YouTube, they shot a, a documentary called Bloodlines. Oh yes, I yeah, know, yeah, and um, it, and Bruce was one of the producers on on um, on Bloodlines, uh, and uh, it is just horrific exposing this entire trade, you know, and um, well, I, I wonder why it hasn't been shut down because I thought that the public outcry to that would have been enough to put pressure to shut that down because ignore everything else because we do 
we do breed animals for animal products, whether that yes, be meat yeah. or other stuff. You know, we do it in agriculture all the time. For sure. So, you know, we, 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 there is this um, moral, d- distinction. moral distinction between species, which yeah, yeah. is a kind of a separate discussion. Yeah, yeah. But just the animal, the, the incredibly poor animal welfare alone yeah. 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 In, the, in bloodlines and yeah. what we know goes on with the breeding of them here, yeah. I thought would have been enough to shut it down. I, I agree. Uh, um, the, the government does not agree. Um, you must remember it, 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 it's, a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So money talks. Money talks. It's just like um, you know. There's a, in this country. There's a huge tax on, on what we call sin, sin tax, which is alcohol and and, and tobacco products. Um, the reason being, call it the sin tax, as it, in a yeah, sin. A sin, you know. <laughs> get boozing it up and 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 smoking a pack of cigarettes, yeah. but it, it benefits the government to tax it at forty five percent because. Um, Firstly, it's a drug. Try to give up cigarettes if you've been smoking yeah. for 30 years like I did. You know, so I'm, I'm vaping away. <laughs> <laughs> I still get my nicotine, but uh, hopefully I don't get lung cancer. But anyway, um, the government make huge money on it. So, Where's the incentive to stop that income stream? Where's the incentive to stop line but It's huge money. Huge money. Um, y- you, you can't just say, well, I'm going to stop that industry and take the few billion rands, South African rands, out of the coffers. So is that the problem? Because we know how bad it is. And we, and, and, and we know the meat can't go to a poor people incentive or whatever, like even elephant can. You know, the Kruger Park is completely overpopulated. They should, they, They've they got should, a big problem with elephants. They though. should harvest 25% of the elephants. And, and I agree, and it's such an uncomfortable discussion to have. It's not for me. No, but for, to, if, to tell your average person on the street, I know Kruger National Park, one of the most famous national parks in the world, maybe yeah. behind Yellowstone possibly. Sure. People go there, they want to see the elephants. And, and they're you beautiful. Them, and they're, yeah. I mean, I'm about to go and spend the next three months with elephants. I yeah. mean, they're, yeah. they're incredible. Yeah. Um, and I had a very in-depth conversation uh, with um, an American um, on an American science podcast about yeah, yeah. elephant population management yeah. and the need yeah. for us to intervene in that. And it's it is a very difficult discussion to have because it's it such is. a charismatic animal and it's very emotional. People get extremely extremely upset. The problem is as soon as you put a fence around something. <laughs> And there's fences everywhere. Hey, yay, yay. Which is a great South African saying, if we don't have an answer, hey, yay, yay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but once you put a fence around it and you stop natural migration patterns, you can go on a Google Earth and you can see those elephant migration patterns going from the Kruger Park up to Lake Malawi through Mozambique. Um, but the, the top fence is open now, though, is it? It is. It, they can op- migrate out the top now. They've, they've opened it up to Mozambique and the Trans Frontier Park, but r- those elephants are really scared, eh? Um, the, the, and, and be in no doubt, they only opened up that fence because they had too many elephants. In they had park. too many elephants. Now, this was a, hopefully a solution for them. It was, but those old bulls and those old cows have come through the Frelimo, Renamo, Mozambique and Bush War that, that went on for 20 years. Yeah. And, and they all, know. They know. They, they've seen their, their fellow elephants get their limbs blown, blown off by minefields that are still in existence in those, some parts of those northern parts oh, of Mozambique. It's just horrendous even thinking about so it. So those, those alpha alpha. And, and beta cows that lead herds, they don't, they won't go there. Let's screw that. We're not going we're, back. We're, I'm not going across the Limpopo. You're insane. So they're not moving. Um, so you know, the, this is an animal that lives 70 to 75 years old, and those the matriarchic cows aren't. They, they they know where they're safe. So do they have a because. I have been talking about the overpopulation of Kruger Park since I started to spend a lot of time in, in yeah. Africa, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is was about from about when I, from when I was about nineteen. I started to spend a yeah. lot of time here. Yeah. So for the last thirteen, fourteen years, insane. Yeah, I've been talking about it with people, and yeah, as to the best of my knowledge, nothing has really been done. Nothing's been done, and um, they've they've now um, very recently uh, shut down water points. Which is a start. So to encourage them out of that. Yeah. So if 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 you have abundant food which there is in the Kruger Park and if you've got an abundant resources that's all you need to make an elephant happy and if an elephant's happy just like most mammals they're going to have sex and if they have sex they're going to make babies but if you make them unhappy uh, it, just like we know you know <laughs> you've you, you got to make your I girlfriend, try and avoid the you, baby you make your girlfriend happy. <laughs> um, you take their water source away um, then there's more competition for resources. When there's more competition for resources, all sorts of population dynamics grow. And then you're going to 
uh, drop their carrying capacity capability of the area. And that's yeah. currently what's happening. So it's a start. Hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, they're, they're still... Even if they're not breeding, they live so long. Just the current population that's there, even if it's well, static, is too much. You're 100% correct. So uh, maybe I can give folks an idea. Um, there's a rare vulture species in, in, in Southern Africa called the whiteback vulture, and they nest in particular roosting nesting sites. And one of their favored nesting sites is called a – it's an acacia species called a knobthorn. Um, knobthorns are a hardwood, and they grow – they take a really long time to grow, like a couple of hundred years. And a, a whiteback vulture like 20 to 30 meet, meter high knobthorns because you can't climb up there. They've got horrible thorns, so they're predator-proof. Um, elephants – think knob thorns are the best things to spilt milk. They will push a knob thorn down. Onto the ground. Straight onto the ground. 300-year-old knob thorn. They will chew on its bark, and when they've had enough, they'll walk away. Now they are packing these huge, sharp rocks around every knob thorn they can find. Uh, so that they, because they won't want to walk on it. Yeah. So to get to push it's, over, yeah. it's a pachyderm, so it's got mm. soft underfeet. Um, Whiteback vultures are in huge trouble. They're no more knob thorns. And this is direct, this is not for any other reason. Direct, knock on. Now, and, and this is the thing I try and explain to people, yeah, is that we, yeah. really, we, we need to understand these knock-on effects yeah. and implications yeah. Yeah, of yeah. populations of animals. Yeah, so elephants are, are, are like solely responsible of changing a savanna into grassland. This is what we're seeing happening. And as we're getting these big mature trees smashed and broken down and, and, and marula trees and, and even... Um, Baobabs that have been around for two, three thousand years, they get debarked by elephants because they they think their bark's delicious. Yeah. Well, you can, uh, can you can eat every part of a baobab, can't you? You pretty much. Yeah. And it's actually succulent. It's not a. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. That's I, a, that's I, a, I, another I only discussion. Found that out like eight weeks ago. <laughs> I didn't know that before. <laughs> that's insane. But um, moving back to pangolins and saying how large a role can one species play in the environment, like like an elephant, it can change entire ecosystems. People ask, okay, so. What, What's the pangolin's role? Yeah. It hasn't got a role. Why should something have a role? It, p people say everything's got a role and it functions, it aerates the soil and it controls ants and termite population numbers. You've got to have 100 pangolins in a small area um, to have any type of influence on, on ant population. We, we walk um, uh, three, four pangolins in an area that's about four hectares. Now, that's three, four pangolins at five, six hours a pangolin. And what's happened uh, with these queen ants and termites is they've compensated for the mortality. By breeding more. By breeding more. Really? And so everybody says, yeah, they're controlling insects. Well, that's not true. They eat, only eat ants and termites. And then uh, I saw a recent post on, on social media the other day that it, pangolins help farmers so they don't throw, they throw less insecticide. <laughs> Rubbish. And ants aren't bad for crops no. anyway. And you can't control them through pangolins. So... As far as I'm concerned, they have no real functional value. But as far how I see it is every species um, has a right to life and to live and to exist as, as a species. You well, know? you know, we have a as as a species ourselves, yes, which is part of the which are part of this planet. Sure, um, but the most intelligent species that is in existence, as far as we know. Uh, which I think to be true. I think that we yes. have, we definitely have a responsibility to understand yeah. our impacts sure. on those other species. And I, I, I can't see how we can sit comfortably knowing that yeah. we are responsible for the extinction of an, uh, a species yeah. when we, where we can possibly control the outcome. I think it's extremely embarrassing. And yeah. we have already lost a shitload of species. We Even in my lifetime, we've lost species. We're losing 100 species a year on average. A year? A year on average. Some species... I, I've never heard that stat. 100 yeah, a year. 100 a year on average. Uh, that was a statement made by a, a huge amount of research by Simon Stewart about a decade ago. A decade ago. Some of There could be more. Well, we haven't discovered some of the species. We, 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 well, there's probably we, some we species it. that we've, we haven't discovered which we've lost. Exactly. Mm. So, I mean, pangolin biology, physiology, ecology, population dynamics is pretty much unrecorded. We have studied the Temis ground pangolin, the one that you met. We know virtually nothing about the four other African species, the white-bellied tree pangolin, the black-bellied tree pangolin, and the giant ground pangolin. We know, we don't know how, how long they live. We, 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 it we, seems incredible to me that we don't know this. Reproductive stuff. biology, we haven't a cooking clue. 
We, we, did, we do, didn't. Do we know gestation periods? Not at all. See, I asked Francois that question, and not that I didn't believe him, because yeah. we were following up the, the yeah. one pangolin, which name I forget now, uh, which was due to have a pup. And that was the first question I asked him. Yeah. I said, well, how long is the gestation period? Yeah. He said, uh, um, I don't think we know. The one and that's crazy. The one American scientist said 12 months. I said, you're insane. This animal is two kilograms. If it, it, its closest genetic relative is a domestic cat. So the gestation must be similar to a domestic cat. So he, he couldn't argue that because th th that's the philosophy of beyond the science. But like some mammals, like bears, they're able to carry the sperm and impregnate them. A delayed implantation. Exactly. Same as roe deer. Actually. Exactly. Yeah. So when the environment, now he did a study on white-bellied, captive white-bellied pangolin in the, in the United States that they had one in captivity. And from mating to giving birth was close to a year. And so he ah. said, that's the gestation period. I said, ah. It was probably delayed implantation. And we didn't know pangolins had that. That's, so I wonder if they can control it for the correct um, period of the year where they know it's going to be beneficial to give birth. I think you're 100% right. I think there is a breeding season like there is in most mammals. Um, when conditions are right, that is when they, you know, they give birth. So we, 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 we look at synchronized breeding and synchronized foaling and lambing. We, we've seen it in impala. We've seen it in wildebeest. We've seen it in zebra. It's, it's, a, it's, it's called predator satiation. In other words, you have so many babies, the predators can't eat them all. Yeah. But... The conditions are beautiful in spring, green grass, warm weather. Yeah. So it's the best opportunity for yeah. survival. Now you stick a, a, an, a tropical African tree pangolin in a North American environment where it's cold and it's horrible and, and, and people are staring at it. It's, it's, this is what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So um, gestation period, we don't know. Um, we don't know if they um, monogamous we, or, or polygamous or multiple partners. We don't know. We don't know if the females move through the territorial ranges of males and then we think that they choose a male, either on his, his lovely habitat, like his home, or his good looks, you know, like, <laughs> like the girls. Or how he smells after rolling in dung. <laughs> you see, and they do do that. That was incredible witnessing that. Yeah, that was, you were fortunate to see that behavior. We don't know why they do that. That may be to uh, control um, parasites. It may be some sort of nice deodorant. Um, we don't know. Um, and then they stay in that male's territory, um, you know, uh, f for the duration that their pup is weaned, which is anything from sort of um, five to eight months that the pup is carried around on the mom's back and weaned off uh, onto a natural diet from, from her milk. Hmm. Yeah. That's a, such a fascinating species. And Incredible. It, it, it is amazing that there is, you know, there are animals out there and they won't be the only one. Yeah. where we actually know so little about them sure. still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, in the last decade, um, you know, we've published 12 articles on, on the science of pangolins and, and it's wonderful around the world to, to see scientists from all over Europe, even England, the United States, from Canada, from Australia, uh, coming to Africa and helping us understand these creatures and helping us to understand their biology and science. And as you say, we have to know what makes them tick to be able to manage them properly and to find solutions to this huge trade. I mean, the, if we took all the rhino, lion, elephant, and we multiplied it by a thousand, it doesn't come anywhere near the illegal trade in pangolins. Wow. It's just insane. And yet, I mean, it's, I've seen it in the media a little bit more. I mean, literally only in the last six months, I think. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. up until now, people just weren't even talking about it. No, no. And they don't know it because you can't go to, you can still go to a zoo and see a rhino and see an elephant, and see a lion, and see a tiger. You can't go see you and see a pangolin. No. So people, it's difficult for, for folks to um, embrace something you don't know, you know? Yeah. Right, we've just, uh, we've just moved locations twice, just to find it, uh, <laughs> a, a, a bit of a quiet spot. Yeah. Uh, Ray, one of the things I, I, I wanted to, to get into was a little bit of your background, because we, you know, we've kind of dug into the African Pangolin Working Group and what you're doing there, and yeah. loads into pangolins and... We've got into rhinos now as well and elephants, which has been fantastic. <laughs> but what, is your, what was your background leading up to setting up the African Pangolin Working Group? So, um, yeah, I trained as an ornithologist uh, at the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute at the University of Cape Town, where I did my master's 
on uh, two species of upland game birds, red wing and grey wing Franklin in the highland grassland hills of South Africa and then did my PhD on a Swainson Spurfowl, which is another very hardy, uh, more pheasant type of, of game bird in the savannah regions um, just north of Pretoria where they capitalise on, on agricultural uh, crops. And um, yeah, so I had to leave ornithology behind a little bit to... Uh, as I became sort of engrossed in pangolins. It's been all-consuming for you now, I imagine. Completely. It, you know, um, the illegal trade, your phone, you can't ignore it at two in the morning if, if you've got a poacher trying to sell you a pangolin. Uh, it doesn't stop. And we work very closely with the police and they, you know, um, working hours are not what it used to be. But but I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, you know, really, it's 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 such a phenomenal group of species. The, the order is called the Folidota. Uh, and they they own very unique order, you know. So uh, eight species of penguins around the world, four in Asia, four in Africa. But I still do a, bit, a little bit of ornithological work. Um, some rare species I work on: southern ground hornbills and yellow-breasted pipits. So I, I I still keep my wings. You, you lecture as well? Yeah, I'm a I'm a full professor at, at one of the universities in Pretoria. So um, I, I teach first, second, third years and honours, and I've got a couple of master students in the field. That pays my salary, so I have to try to <laughs> behave myself. <laughs> I'm, in the, I'm not in the office a lot because I'm out with pangolins, uh, either pulling them out the trade or helping with a release. Um, but as long as I, uh, my, my students do well and they pass, and, and they, no, that's they, all that's they, needed. they leave me alone. <laughs> I wish I had had a lecturer like you when I was at university. <laughs> my subjects weren't quite as interesting, though. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, you, you were telling me... Um, before we started recording, about um, a project that you're going to be doing a count on birds for in August this year. Tell me a bit about yeah. that because I, from the little, I, I stopped you because I wanted to get it uh, recorded. But yeah, there was a lot of parallels and similarities with home from yes. what, from what the little you told me and the grass moors. Um, so our high, highland grasslands in in this country are, are under threat um, from overgrazing and overburning and a combination of both. Um, and then also mining industry, we've got large uh, um, shallow deposits of, of coal over these highland grasslands. And, um, you know, less than 2% are formally conserved in this country. And these highland grasslands hold extremely unique um, fauna and flora, uh, a, a very unique invertebrates, spider communities, and birds for that matter, mist belt birds. And... Um, Two species of upland grassland game bird are your your red wing and your grey wing Franklin, which capitalise on these grasslands. As soon as you burn too frequently and you graze too intensely, um, they disappear. When you're talking about burning, you're talking about for agricultural purposes, for grazing agriculture. For grazing, yeah, yeah, so 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 for stock farming. So your your sheep farmers here like your sweet felt. This is sour felt. So, um, but if you burn at the onset of the um, spring and summer rains, you're going to get that sweet felt coming through. Um, look, it gets rid of the horrible old moribund stuff, but annual burning is just too much. Um, you, you're starting to deplete the seed bed because these grasslands have to mature, flower, seed, and add to the seed bed. But if you begin to burn a blanket, burn every year, you're eventually going to start depleting. Because these the are big bed. burns, like across They're huge, huge, areas. Yeah. huge. You know, when we're talking about. Um, 15, 20, 30 kilometer wide burns just wow. ru running through with a warm wind behind it. They're big, hey? Which is very different to the burns that we have on our uplands, which are m way smaller and highly managed. I mean, right. so you, you'll end up with an age spectrum in, in an area uh, yep. of, of between zero and sort of seven years. But that's the right way to do it, you see. So I did a, a study and we, we, we did a practical three-year approach to burning this mosaic type of system. Exactly, yeah. So you'd get a lightning strike in summer and you'd get a little patch burn here, patch burn there. And we followed the mosaic thing and, and we compared, I compared five farms that had the old traditional 100-year-old blanket burn to five farms that had been following the sort of the mosaic burn for the last decade. And it was chalk and cheese. The bird diversity, bird communities, insect communities, game bird population was just fantastic in this mosaic environment. And um, at the turn of the millennium, we had our first shoot sort of in 1999 where um, I, I've been doing counts on, on this particular piece of grassland for quite a while. And uh, you So know, how did your interest in this particular area start? Well, so I, why did you end up there? Well, I, I was a falconer, you know, flying peregrines oh, okay. and, uh, over my English pointers. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, 
I, I don't really want to carry on studying. I've been studying for too long. Teepers, man, I've got two degrees. Wow. So then there was this advertisement saying, um, game bird biologist post for a master's degree. Um, some experience with working dogs will be required. I said, wow, I can just fly my peregrine all yeah, day. You, you can have fun. <laughs> I can have a huge tool, yeah. you know. Uh, so I had a, a, I had a brace of English pointers and um, sent through my CV and said, well, I didn't do too badly in my honours degree for my zoology. How about it? And um, next minute, I was on a plane down to Cape Town in an interview with um, Professor Tim Crow, who's one of the finest game bird biologists in the world, you, and um, Dr. Rob Little, who did his PhD on gray, gray wing Franklin wing shooting in the Eastern Cape and looking into the industry. Um, so I proposed a sort of a 15% offtake, which is a moderate offtake for the first shoot. I think and this was based on counts that you did. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, reproductive biology, counts, turnover rates, covey sizes, um, all of that. Um, how, how many grey wing can we shoot? How many red wing can we shoot? What's sustainable? I, I, they didn't even reach that. I think we took off about 5 or 6%. But the point being that 15,000 hectare grassland reserve is the only reserve in this country that protects that particular high mountain saw felt to meet a triandra dominated grassland. And the reserves fences weren't maintained, the staff hadn't been paid. Um, and the money generated from just one shoot, 10,000 pounds, paid their staff for the next year and, and repaired the fences. So what, what was the alternative to this? So if it hadn't been, if you hadn't been monitoring it, working out what the offtake was, bringing in uh, people who were going to go and uh, hunt this surplus yeah. that you... Yeah. What, what was the alternative? The government was going to sell it. And it would have become what? Commercial sheep farming. And, and, and then all of that biodiversity would have been gone. Completely gone. Then they would have introduced trout into the rivers. And trout is... A, it, it's an exotic in South Africa. It's a huge trout industry, which is fantastic. But the trout is a super predator. And there's two species of endemic... Uh, um, fish that occur in those upland catchment grassland areas. You must understand the, 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 the wetlands that occur in these high mountain grasslands feed huge entire river systems like the Elans River and the Olifant River that go into the Kruger Park. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. That's They're their, massive catchment. That's their catchment. Yeah. That is exactly their catchment. So the wetlands will be destroyed because they drain the wetlands to, to, to make it more suitable for grassland grazing and crop agriculture. And the overgraze, um, the burning and grazing. So it would have been completely destroyed. Now we've got a 15,000 hectare reserve um, that, that holds, I don't know how many species of unique orchid, endemic bird species, um, a very rare rabbit, um, I forget the name of it, it's a, it's a huge funny looking thing, but lots of mammals that are also rare and endemic to these grasslands. So what's happened is these two little birds which taste damn good as well. You know? They do. Yeah. Yeah. Have become an umbrella species for an entire ecosystem. So you know that if those species are doing well and you're, you're managing them, yes. and then there's, there's the economic component of managing them, Correct. that everything underneath them yes. that uh, also use that, that yeah. ecosystem are going to be doing well. And that, that's what you've shown. I've published a paper in a journal called Biodiversity and Conservation on exactly that in okay. 1999, correlating the population abundance of, in particular, the red wing Franklin and all these other species of birds. And as soon as the red wing frankton dip below a certain point as a result, and there's a correlation between increased grazing and increased burning, and they dip off and they fall off the radar, all those other species start disappearing as well. So we get an assemblage change in avian community structure. These entire assemblages, which is made up of multiple different species of birds, forms an assemblage. The assemblage composition moves with that change. And as you bring in more intense grazing and more frequent burning, these communities of birds change completely. So you get those generalists like the sparrows and the pigeons and the doves, and, and then you, you're losing your puppets and your larks and your yeah. franklins. The, the, the require the more fragile habitat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because the, yeah. The, the generalists can deal with almost anything. They can handle it, you know. Yeah. And, and we're finding this direct sort of correlation with, with species management and, and entire landscape management. Um, and on a landscape level, which is so important, you know, um, you, you, you can't just do it in isolated islands and in pockets. You've got you, you to look at it on a geographic landscape level. It's fascinating because I um, just recently wrote a, an article for uh, for Modern Huntsman uh, in Volume Three, which is literally just coming out now. Yeah, uh, which looked at the parallels between what our management in our uplands and our moorlands in Scotland um, for grouse 
yeah. and using that as a kind of an umbrella species in the species, which yeah. brings the the economics into the area and able to manage them. Yeah. And two grass species in the states: the sage um, sage grass, right, um, and the rough wing grass. Yes, or the rough grass. In, very, in a very similar in a very similar way that there are so many parallels with regard to the management and understanding um, understanding our role as humans on the landscape and how we need to be sympathetic to that landscape but by looking at a particular species like like the sage grouse like the red grouse which has a, a commercial component and a, and a vested sure. interest by sure. people sure. but that is so key yeah. to protecting those ecosystems because yeah. without having a vested interest in them who is going to spend the time no, to look at them you see not only has it there's a financial interest but there's also a, a heritage if you look at sage lands, grass moors, montane grasslands, it, 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 there's a cultural significance to them as well, you know. And those species are um, symbolic. And red wing Franklin and grey wing Franklin and the calls that are, are very symbolic of these high mountain grasslands. Um, and those ecosystems have evolved over, over many millennia to become fire climax in environments. So they do need the fire component. but They if, need that regime of fire. But, yeah. but it would have historically been a natural regime. And that's the same as like they see... S seven to eight years yeah. Cy cycle. Yeah, which, which is basically what we replicate on our grouse moors. Right. Seven to eight years. And yeah. this is what we need to replicate up there. So... Um, you know, we're trying to tell the, the mostly in those high mountain grasslands, the, the, the agricultural aspect, the sheep farmers, you can do a mosaic and you can get the system pretty, to be just as productive and at the same time not lose revenue but conserve this very, very sensitive ecosystem, which is, I mean, if you look at grasslands worldwide and you look at sage areas and, and grass moors, um, they're shrinking. <laughs> they are at at a, at a crazy rate. It's insane, and our sort of our lack of concern in this really concerns me. It's very scary because you look at like the, the sagebrush system yeah. in, in North America yeah. is the most endangered yeah. ecosystem yeah. in all of North America, yeah. and most yeah. scientists will will tell you that they, yeah, yeah. they will agree with that. Yeah. And yet, it supports like three hundred and fifty yeah. plus different species. It's unbelievable. Of floral fauna. Oh, same same with yeah. our grouse moors. Yeah. We've lost something crazy like forty percent of our sorry. Let me rephrase that. Our, our upland habitat, we've yeah. lost about 40% of it since yeah. the 1950s. That's insane. And that's due to agriculture. That was yeah. due to draining. Yeah. That yeah. was due to liming the areas so that, yeah. so that it would yeah. kill it off and so yeah. that you could have um, yeah. grass. Yeah. The areas, yeah. much of the areas that are left, uh, the very fertile areas that, that hold uh, a lot of um, diversity in both habitat and species, Yeah are now managed as commercial grouse moors because they have the money and the incentive to manage them. Now, they are managing them for primarily one species. Like the, There's no getting around the fact they're doing it for grouse, but the kind of the new... Uh, the new wave of gamekeeper who are the custodians up there, sure. they don't just care about that anymore. Sure. sure. Yes, they care about it because that is their yeah. harvestable offtake yeah. and that yeah. is what they are doing it for. But yeah. they equally care about all the other species that are up there. They, they care about the fact yeah. that there are more curlew nesting on managed grouse yeah. moors yeah. than anywhere else in the entire country that's and they're insane. the most endangered bird species in the country. You see, it's right in front of you. And one of the aspects I looked at, I, I thought, okay... So these young game birds, that, that, that they're precocial, so they run around like crazy as they're born, um, feed primarily on insects for the first couple of weeks of their life. As many do, yeah. What happens if we took away all the insects? So I did a study on the spiders. And I oh, that's interesting. I compared the spiders in those overgrazed and uh, um, overburnt grasslands to the spiders in the, in, the, in, the, in the conserved areas that are burnt with a mosaic. And the spider dynamics just went insane. So the, 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 the spiders in the, in the overgrazed areas were dominated by these, these really horrible species that would run off to their prey and run them down and eat them, you know. Yeah. And, and, and in, these, in, these, in these protected areas, the spiders were dominated by web builders, which would just sit, wait, and chill. And it, with this huge impact of um, invertebrate predators, the, the number of and availability of invertebrates in the, in, in the grazed and, and agricultural grasslands had crashed. So there was very little food for the young um, yeah. hatched. And uh, it's so uh, important that they have food at that first few days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but the food availability in, 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 in the protected grasslands 
uh, was huge. It was massive, and those birds were just absolutely flourishing. So, when you look at you know knock-on effects of how to manage an, an habitat, you, you're managing for biodiversity. Although the the commercial result will be the the harvest of an umbrella species such as a game bird, a, a, a grouse, or a Franklin, or, or whatever, is 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 fantastic. It's them that are indirectly the the custodians of these protected habitats, and it's difficult sometimes to tell governments to say don't sell that land because you've got all this unique fauna and flora you know how do you sell it to 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 some of these officials it's very difficult so we said to them because it's also complicated it's, it's not an easy thing to understand and people need land yeah. you know um if we can pay their bill and we can pay their salaries is that okay no problem so 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 we did it and it worked and in august this year they haven't shot for a couple of seasons so they they've asked me to come and walk w for them to to see if there's any change in the dynamic of the birds and if the birds are still there to to actually take on a system. So you're going to do a count, I'm which, is, do a count. which is exactly what we do every season on our grass yeah. moors. The, yeah. I mean, they all have records of each beat yeah. going, you know, some of them might be going back Hundreds. more than 100, you know, well more than 100 years. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll know what their counts have been on those areas at that particular time in the year, every year. And by that, they can work, okay, we've had a good year, we've had a bad year, and adjust the numbers that they're going to, to shoot come August the 12th appropriately. And in some years where... It's a bad season. Maybe there was some very cold, wet weather in the four-week period just after most of the chicks were born. Uh, born. Yeah. They might not shoot at all. You, you see, that type of hands-on management is important because you, you, you can't just expect a natural population of a species to, to, to toe the line and follow the... You know, we, we've got long extended periods of drought. Drought plays a, a huge, huge role on invertebrate abundance because that's just what the babies eat. So I'm going to walk the hills again for the first time there in 20 years. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I know. It's going to be so exciting. So, uh, it, it, you know, if you're around, as I mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah, I'd love to join that. It'll, it could be. Yeah. It, when, when Tyler listens to this podcast, is the, the, the editor of Modern Huntsman, yeah. I think that might have to go into one of the future volumes because yeah. – Game birds in Africa yeah. don't get talked about that much because there's such a focus on the bigger species. Well, it's just when you see these two birds fly, you're going to go, wow. It, I'm going to be, can I, uh, do we have a surplus because I want to come back and, <laughs> and, and hunt myself? <laughs> just, 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 yeah, bring the over and under all the side by side and just pack it in your bag. You yeah. never know. You know? <laughs> but I, th that grey wing has got one hell of a speed on it. The, the red wing is a little bit more bulky game bird. It's in the valleys and the wetlands, but the grey the gray wing is right on the crest of those hills and it comes up in a, in a covey of about 20 oh, beautiful. and you, you can you can do a, a good left and a right but don't wait too long hey? no because they, they they're a spectacular bird i hunted quail in new zealand for the first time last year or the year before oh yeah and that was good fun i yeah. never hunted quail. i mean because it's such a small little bird it's a small little bird but it's got its own unique fly style yeah it does it really yeah. does and the way that they get up and then yeah. they come down again and then they yeah. get up and then they come down again. I, I do a, a little bit of wing shooting but you know i, I was flying a, a um what's similar to a little european sparrowhawk we call in this country a little red-breasted sparrowhawk which is a little nuclear sparrowhawk off the fist on quail and i tell you he gave him a run Good for fun. his money hey because they cruise along with that rapid rapid speed i mean the huge breast muscles just brrr, and then they just drop boom like yeah. you haven't seen them, just like out the sky, out the sky, gone straight into the into the rough stuff, and you can't find them. Then they run. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, well that, that's yeah. what yeah that's what these quail yeah. did in, in yeah. New Zealand as well. And they get down, but they yeah. might not be there. They could be yeah. another yeah. few hundred meters up the valley. But we've got some good wing shooting. You know, we do quite a few guinea dri driven guinea fowl shoots in the Free State here, and and um, out towards the north of Pretoria, there's some swains and spur fowl shoots. We, 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 this, the spur fowl really capitalise on the grain agriculture. They they hammer the I've seen that the, yeah. quite a bit. So we, we don't like to go and whack the population, but we 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 do keep them in check because they 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 breed all year round. Um, they they're quite an invasive species in in the sense of the word um, that they do capitalise on crop agriculture. So the farmers we hold a a big school function, and all the wing shooting proceeds go to go to the church and to the schools, and and we build libraries and stuff. So yeah, that's that's in the in the in the flatlands called the Springbok Flats, and in, in the area north of Pretoria, all the way up to a, to a, to a town called uh, Polokwane. Um, agricultural croplands, maize fields, sunflower fields, and uh, we, we 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 do pigeon shooting and swains and spur fowl shooting there to try and regulate numbers, and uh, plow the money straight back into the community. That's great. Yeah. Just uh, as a way of sort of uh, getting towards wrapping up, I mean, for people who are 
listening to this podcast and they've you know they've heard you you know a man who's clearly deeply invested in the conservation of or well, many species pangolin being you know, one of your primary concerns and they've heard you talk about you know many other species uh, you know, there, there's no question um, about your sort of dedication to the, the conservation and survival of species. You see my pangolin tattoo? Oh, I have not. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> I'm going to take a picture of that before I leave. That, yeah, is, yeah, that is brilliant. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, look, look, look at that. Okay, well, yeah, that, that dedication. <laughs> dedication to the core, my, inked. My wife says to me, you're 50 years old. What the hell are you going <laughs> And you said exactly, I'm 50 years old. Who cares? So I don't give a shit, you know. <laughs> um, uh, designed by a friend artist and, and uh, I, had, I had a friend tattoo it and she's opened up a tattoo studio and giving half the proceeds of every pangolin to our cause. That's brilliant. And insane. That's Just fantastic. I'm so humbled by her, yeah. Oh, but they, you anyway, know, they, they've heard this from you and yeah. yet now, you know, for the last sort of 20 minutes or so, we've been, uh, you know, we've touched on a hunting element of it. And sure. This, this idea that it yeah. can form part of a, a conservation and management practice, yeah. which for people who listen to this podcast, it will not be uncommon because we, we talk about that quite a lot. Right. But outside, outside in the sort of the bigger world, your general public, yeah. it's a very difficult conversation to have. It's a conversation we try and have a lot because I want people to, I want to have very open, honest, pragmatic discussions so that people can really understand it. Yeah. How, how like, how do you tackle that balance? Because I'm sure that in the, you know, with the many people that you deal yeah. with around the world yeah. who are... Yeah. Uh, deeply involved in conservation. I can't yeah. imagine all of them agree that that is a, an important component. I think the, the large majority of the public, and I'm talking global public here, um, are very much against the entire hunting industry and hunting practice. As a conservation biologist, I work every day on the ground with landscapes and entire ecosystems. And I've seen how um, ethical hunting uh, can conserve entire landscapes um, and it's sustainable you know it's 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 not cruel it's very professional and and money's plowed straight back into um, managing landscapes paying people to manage the landscapes keeping out invasive species you know if you keep these animals that may be trophy hunting species um, uh, uh, you manage them properly you have to manage their habitat properly you can't just put them in a cage and feed them lucerne it one one hand feeds the other and if we look at the hunting industry now i'm talking for southern africa people may have heard on the on the news um you know, Botswana banned hunting and I was bringing hunting back and the the, the revenue generated had hurt them so much uh, in terms of managing an entire uh, GDP for the country that yeah. they had to reconsider. Well, because some of those really remote areas, like yeah. people just evacuated out of them. For sure. And the, nothing was being done with nothing them Nothing was being done. The water holes weren't being maintained. No. The, you know, like the pumps were yeah. dying. Yeah. There was no water for the, yeah. for the animals to drink. It was like Kaya Bay Pl Plateau in, in the United States a couple of decades ago. The, the people said, oh, look at those wolves just eating all those caribou and eating all those antelope. Those wolves are horrible. And they went and shot all the wolves. Then the antelope said, oh, wow, there's no wolves. I'm just going to make lots of antelope. Yeah. And they ate so much, they grazed so much, they, they died of starvation. So there's a balance in everything you do. And there's a balance in nature. And I hear people say, we mustn't get involved in nature. Well, that's being ignorant. Mankind, well, because we are too involved. We are in every corner, every sphere, every aspect of every place on this planet, we are involved. And we have to manage what we have been involved in because we've changed it. Mm -hmm. So um, we are, uh, I had this very similar, uh, I'm echoing a conversation yeah. I had when I was in Namibia, but it is our responsibility to continue to be involved. No, it is. Because if yeah. we remove ourselves from these systems, yeah. the outcome will not be preferable. It will be devastating. And it will be devastating on a global biodiversity catastrophe. We're already in the sixth extinction, you know. Let, let's not sort of spur it on. We try and have to try and reverse it. I've seen in my lifetime <clears throat> entire tracts of land. When I'm talking about tracts of land, I'm talking about millions and millions of hectares being transformed from cattle ranching to game farming industry, right up in the Limpopo River Valley where, where Francois is based. Yeah, it's Those were up there. all cattle farms. Those were all, now they're all game farms. Yeah. And actually, I was on one of them actually that was a cattle farm and now it's, and now it's, and a now game it's farm. amazing bush again. And when, when you were on that release the other day, that was a cattle farm. And now he may have one, two or three hunts a year, but he's got, um, he fills his lodges all year with e ecotourism um, guests. 
So it's 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 a win-win situation. So it moved completely uh, onto biodiversity farming, if you can call it that, a away from agricultural farming. Um, you know, so you can have a debate about the hunting industry for years. I mean, it, it, people have very, very strong opinions. Um, I, I don't want to take away from their opinion. But when you've seen it working on the ground at the level I've seen it working uh, and uh, on, on the ethical way it's done. Uh, I mean, I was a, I, I was a, I'm a master falconer. I haven't practiced for a while, but I've been flying hawks for more than two decades. We hunt, you know, um, and, and it's a passion. And and I th I think you need to also listen to everybody's story and just look at the dividends of how much conservation area is now controlled by hunting concessions, and I'm I'm all for it, you know, and I've given my life to conservation. And we also need to, and people who listen to this will feel like I say this on every show, <laughs> uh, but we also need to work out what the alternative is because if you decide that you don't like it for whatever reason, sure, because it's you morally object to it, yeah, work out what the replacement to that is. And if you can find a better solution, I am yeah. all ears. Yeah, yeah. But very often there isn't. You see, if you go into the into the, the um, private conservation industry, you look at famous game farms in South Africa like Londa Lozi, Marla Marla, even those managed by um, and beyond, which are just phenomenal. It's a huge investment. If if you want to um, bring out the type of ecotourism that's going to look after a thirty forty thousand hectare a bush felt reserve in this country and in southern africa your investment has to be many 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 millions of us dollars so if you can do that and you can do it at the level that its occupancy is in excess of 90 percent at above at a going rate of a thousand us a day right but if you take the middle man in south africa um who who, who, who can put it put maybe 800,000 pounds in, into something. He's not going to create the lodge that's going to tick over what what you need to run. Uh, the type of industry that will replace game farm industry, that's what you're looking at. Yeah, and that is an answer, but if you can fund it, that's fine. Um, but to get the backing is, is not easy. So you've got a lot of these small-scale 3,000 hectare game farms. They've got a lodge on them. They do two or three hunts uh, uh, per season during the winter months, and the rest of the year are, are safari operators. Yeah, and that's how they make it, you know. And, and they find that balance between the two, and they one do. helps to fund the other completely. And if you look at the venison industry, uh, people are moving away from a commercial uh, a meat. Yeah, it's, it's but particularly here. I mean, here it's very prevalent. You you can yeah. find all manner of species that you can yeah. eat, especially biltong. <laughs> biltong. I mean, yeah. I've always got biltong at yeah. home. But but uh, I, I mean, if fattening up cattle, fattening up uh, chickens, fattening up, it it's just gone into a different level. And we're pretty concerned about the genetic makeup of that meat and the health of that meat. And you know, just simply, I just love the taste of venison. Yeah, me too. And yeah. and in terms of environmental impact, those animals yeah. belong there. Like they, they are supposed to live yeah. in that ecosystem, so they're way more sympathetic yeah. in terms of their impact on the ecosystem than a cattle farm or sheep. For sure, and they're not in feedlots. No, you know, I, I, I can't handle it. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a bunny hugger big time. I mean, I, my, both my Labradors are rescue animals, um, but 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 in in the in the greater um, scope of things, if you look in particular, a lot of European countries that aren't large, they've got small areas and these. All these feedlots and you know it's just ter it's horrific. Um, I've been into abattoirs. I've been into chicken farming industries. I've seen what happens in there. It's just absolutely horrific. I've bought meat where it says free range, free range. And I've gone and visited the places, you know, because I do some ethical work as well for the university, where they do research projects and in animal production. Then we got to go visit. Okay. And, and they call it rubbish. Really? They so put it on the packaging. It's a lot of wool being pulled out uh, of people's eyes. Big time, big time. And that happens just so often. But I mean, that's another discussion for another day. It's 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 a it's a big topic, and people are very sensitive about it. I understand. Um, I always say to people that you know, in terms of your consumption, yeah. and particularly when we're talking about this with regard to salmon farming, yeah, just take a little bit of time out your day to work out where your stuff's coming from. Yeah, yeah. 
and don't support an industry that yeah. you know is having a negative impact, either yeah. on the actual welfare of the animals that you're yeah. consuming yeah. or have a negative impact on the environment that they operate in. And salmon farming is an easy example to pick on in, sure. in, in sure. the UK. And I yeah. won't eat farmed salmon because of it. Yeah. And it should declare it's farmed salmon. Yeah. yeah you know. Well, they have to in the UK because you can't actually sell okay. wild salmon. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, d I didn't know that. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, it's a, I, I, we're not on top of it as much as as you guys in 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 Scotland and and other parts of the UK, um, but there, there's a big move afoot where you have to explain to the public and be liable to explain to the public where your product comes from. Um, but I think the game farming industry in South Africa is massive. It's a multi-billion rand industry. It forms. I think it forms even a. Uh, past five percent of the entire country's GDP, um, and it has been responsible for repopulating, you know, much of not just South, oh, not just South Africa, oh, huge. but Southern Africa. Oh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, um, Mozambique, um, even Uganda's capitalising on it now. I mean, well, and now that now the DRC, this project that I'm involved the, in now, exactly yeah. the DRC. So people are saying, cheapest, you know, ecotourism um, in wh whichever way it is, um, five star lodge or hunting hunting industry. Wow, I mean that we, we we can create jobs, we can conserve biodiversity. It's a win-win situation because the world is putting pressure on us to stop destroying ecosystems, and this is an answer. And you know, um, pangolins falls into uh, you know a similar category. If we look at the tree pangolins in Central and West Africa, these tropical forests—they're incredible the way they climb. They're up insane, trees. you know and how they fall and then catch and then catch them. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it's an, and their, their tails are prehensile. It's a fifth limb. Take, the, take those trees away. Those are hardwoods. And you know what hardwoods go for in the United States now? There's huge demand. Those pangolins are stuffed. They are gone. You take the tropical forests away and the giant, pine, giant ground pangolin is gone. Um, it's all about habitat and it's ecosystems. It's all about habitat and ecosystems. So you, you, you put in a maize field, you put in a cotton field, you put in whatever, the Temis ground pangolin is gone. So... Um, although we we people may be concerned about certain ways of repopulating natural ecosystems, you have to bear in mind their umbrellas. They are for for, for species that we're losing on a, on a huge scale. I mean, I spoke about fifty five point eight tons of pangolin scales have left Africa that only I know about this year. We can't keep up. They, they get they, we they're gonna be lost on our watch, and we're to blame. Yeah, no, we yeah. It's important to remember that we, yeah. we have the ability to make things yeah. change. Yeah, 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 we do. And and to sit and do yeah. nothing yeah. is the most irresponsible thing we can possibly do. And if you're sitting, listening today to a podcast, say, well, what can I do? You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a great question. If people yeah. are listening to this and they're yeah. feeling, you know, they're feeling motivated by yeah. this conversation that we've yeah. had, what can they do yeah. to help? If they do, because a lot of people don't have the time to actually go on the ground and get their hands dirty, but people can still help. The majority of people don't, you know, and it's not all about money and donate. It, it, a voice, a voice. Social media is probably the most powerful platform I've come across since the atomic bomb. It is just an immensely powerful tool. Google what it looks like. Google what the species look like. Have a look at what we're doing, and and just say, come, hey, all my friends, let's 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 help this cause. Let's go get a pangolin tattoo. Let's let's, <laughs> let, let's be different. Um, yeah. And, um, Put a bumper, create a bumper sticker and say, save pangolins. Someone's going to come and say, what the hell is that? Yeah. And it raises the awareness of it. It is just big. People and numbers make a difference. They and really do. You know, we saw it when uh, you know when we shouted out to our podcast listeners, the people who follow us, to try and raise some money yeah. for, for you guys. For the yeah, we're extremely group. grateful. It was just wonderful, yeah. But the response was amazing. That's incredible. Like, people were just, they were so, a lot of them didn't even know what it was. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. they became so invested in it. That's amazing. And, you know, that, that auction that happened over a couple of weeks where we were given a lot of items from companies and yeah, individual yeah. people. Yeah. And then people were... You know, putting down good money for this stuff. And that heat signature that you guys used and on a pangolin. 
Yeah. I mean, that's... Oh, with a, with a thermal. Yeah, yeah with a thermal. Yeah, uh, I mean, that, uh, so there, I mean, there's a great example. So Scott Country International. That was insane. Who, uh, all, the, all the stuff came from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we paid for all of that with the revenue, but they also basically sponsored that. So they yeah. they gave it to us for trade and that's then paid for half of the fam- trade cost that's just to support it. And now it's being used actively in the field. Yeah. You and remember? I know Francois put a whole bunch of uh, the camera traps out the other day. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did. Yeah. So, so we, we're getting behavioral footage from those camera traps that we would have to sit there at their burrow for 24 hours. Now we, we, we're getting all of this data and all this information and we're finding that in winter they're coming out and sunning themselves and they're going to bed earlier. They're becoming a lot more diurnal. We didn't know. Huh. So, so how do you start managing the species and managing the behavior? They want to be warmer in winter and they snuggle up in their burrows uh, in the winter time earlier when it gets cold at night. This is the stuff that, that your listeners have been giving to us. Um, that thermal work... I was in Big Five country the other day, and where Francois works is also Big Five. You're getting a telemetry reading coming out of the thick, what we call a, a Hockenstierkbos, a thicket that you can't really go in. And it could be a line in there, so you throw the thermal on it. Ah, okay, there's only a pangolin. Yeah. <laughs> Which is important because you guys need to hey, survive to do the good work. <laughs> he's, he's out there at 11, 12 at night in, in line elephant I buff, know. Well, we were there in, in Leopard country where we were up in the hills. And, 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 and you, you can't see these hoes. No. So he, he throws a the thermal around just to see if. <laughs> it's good. No, it's, no, it's, no it's we're fantastic. extremely grateful, and and you know, um, and the great thing is, we've got money left over. So I know that I'm sure Francois has been speaking to you is to work out yeah. what what we're going to use the next bit of money for. So I think one yeah. of the things he was looking at um, is an endoscope, yeah, to get into the burrows, yes. so you can see what's going on well, or check the burrows. You know, those burrows are used by African rock pythons. They're used by leopard. They they used by black mamba. You know, one bite of a black mamba, you may as well grab a good bottle of. Um, 25 year old whiskers and just go, and for, go to town s- sit under a, <laughs> s- sit under, under a big baobab tree and, and get pissed because you're yeah. not going to make it no. um, so to, you, to just check if they're in there and when that pup is born that one pregnant female we got when that pup is born they left in the burrow for the first week to 10 days so we don't know they're born and we don't want to crawl in there you know no. With a mumba or whatever, so that it'll, it'll be very useful. That sounds like a wonderful. Yeah. So hopefully, thing. when I go and um, I'm going to be passing him yeah. in August. Yeah. Um, we'll try and sort it out. We'll, we'll source yeah. it here and we'll, we'll take yeah. it up to him, which will be great. Brilliant. Well, the folks can see my Instagram page is African Pangolin Conservation, and then the we're active on Facebook and uh, we've got our website up and running. It's just been revamped, which is neat. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Awesome. Uh, we'll stick all the, the contact details in the description for this podcast um, so people can find you guys as well. Oh, cheers, um, but, I mean, you're very often linked on our Instagram and that as well. I oh, so. appreciate you. No, but, it's no, great. Right, thank you so much for taking the time out today. It's been an incredible conversation. Yeah, always and a pleasure. I, I can't you know. wait to share this one with everybody because I think people yeah. are going to take a lot from it. I hope so. And I hope uh, we just bring a little bit more knowledge and light into uh, uh, the Foley Dota, the entire order, which is in huge trouble. But I appreciate you giving me the time. Cheers, man. Oh, thank you. Well, we hope you enjoyed the show. We will be back in two weeks' time. We still need to plan which show it is uh, because I will be away when the the next show's on. Uh, And because I don't know where I'm going to be or if I'll even have signal, I actually doubt it looking at the locations that I am going. I I think we'll have to pre-record that before (laughs) you leave. I I, I don't think there'll be any uh, phone signal. I don't think think there'll be electricity maybe on a generator where you're going if you're lucky. So we'll we'll figure that out. Uh, but yeah, two weeks' time will be the next show. If you want to uh, support the show in any way, then just head over to Patreon. It is uh, you can spell it P A T R E O S S Patreon, and then it's just the Pace Brothers. And like we said, there is a new uh, band which is a podcast supporter. I think it no, it's you tell me, friend. I, I think it's podcast friend. Okay. Uh, but now every category gets something. So the first category gets a podcast sticker after supporting us for two months. Uh, so that's uh, only a pound a month. So uh, And uh, the podcast stickers are imminently coming as well. Uh, so if uh, you are in any of the other categories, we will get a podcast sticker to you as soon as they come in. But there are going to be new stickers that go on the outside of your vehicle because currently me and Byron both have cars with tinted windows in the back and our podcast stickers can't be seen through the tint. So if, I've still got mine on. So but it, I've got, I've got mine on as well. So if we're having this problem, then it, lots of other people are going to be having the problem. And it's not tinted windows because I'm like... 
Oh, like it's a just gangster gangster or something. It's it's just like he's also got the rims that like spin. <laughs> yeah. It's just uh, I don't know. Like a lot of four by four seem to have tinted back windows back because windows, there's yeah. security. security. Yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. you know what I completely forgot to mention, which I meant to in the intro, huh. was the new Defender's just been launched. It has. It has. It'll be. Um, I'll let our listeners buy the first batch. <laughs> Uh, what, a batch the, of defenders. Yeah, yeah. It's like the first year, <laughs> and then we'll find out what problems there are, and then uh, then maybe I can get a second hand one after two or three years. To, to be fair, I think that the price that they're coming in at, it might have for me, it might have to be a second hand one after maybe ten years. Yeah, they're yeah. pretty pricey. Forty thousand pounds starting price. But you don't have to do much to them to suddenly end up at seventy five grand. Uh, I, I bet you, if you go into the showroom, that forty thousand doesn't include the paint. Maybe it won't. Maybe it won't. Or it comes in it white. It won't include the paint, and mm. uh, and everything will be an extra. Look, I I think that some people are giving it a hard time. I actually think it looks pretty cool. Uh, I think that the the issue with it is that it's way more expensive than you know a basic um, Toyota Hilux. Yes, which is a great car. Um, I haven't seen them actually launch a pickup version yet. I know they have a utility version, but I don't think they have one where the back comes off, which is kind of a problem. You know, if you're a farmer or a gamekeeper, I highly doubt. Many farmers are buying this. No, and it's too expensive for yeah. a farmer or a gamekeeper. It, it needed to be in the price of uh, a Hilux yeah. or an Isuzu but it looks smart. or something. It, looks it needed to be £30,000 yeah. in that region. And it's got so much technology in it. I, I mean, you'll never be able to fix that friggin' thing has in the bush. 85 ECUs or something. And you'll never be able to fix that thing. It's I don't doubt that it's probably one of the most capable 4x4s yeah. in the world. But As, uh, as Rich, Richard Hammond said... Never in the history of car making will a car be scrutinized no, as much as no, this they won't be. be. Um, but I'm not trading my my Land Rover for it. That's for sure. Not right now. I certainly wouldn't get rid of my old one. <laughs> <laughs> I can fix that with a spoon. Yeah, uh, it's it's going to be interesting. I, I imagine there'll be lots of lots of reviews and people doing extraordinary things with it over the next few years. Did they actually say when it was going to be available? Next year, 2020. Oh, so it is not until next year. Yeah, you yeah. can. Uh, the waiting list is going to be insane. It'll be huge. It'll probably be their b- biggest car they've ever sold. Yeah, probably. I imagine. Well, I, I am probably going to take one for a test drive. Just but it for only fun, so it only com- is squeaking. It his only toy. comes in uh, automatic. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. But a lot of top range. If you look at the Land Cruisers, a lot of them are automatic as well. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to take one for a test drive yeah. just to see. Put your name down on the list then. Yeah. Otherwise, I might have to wait six months for a test drive. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was going to say, if you uh, lovely people would like to leave us a review, please. Uh, we have we get reviews all the time, but it really does help us with uh, rankings. And also, the more reviews, then our show pops up more in people's feeds for suggestions and things like that. And also, uh, people do uh, listen to shows based off of reviews. Yeah, they do. So it's really helpful if you leave us a review on iTunes. If you're on the app, I think all you have to do is scroll down and there's some stars, hit five stars, leave us a little review. That'd be awesome. You don't, if you really can't be bothered, you can actually just hit the five stars. But yeah, we'd, we'd like to see we'd what like, you think We'd like well. to see because we do read them. Yeah. Uh, and makes us feel good. If you're not on uh, iTunes, because I'm not on it, uh, then uh, leave us a review on like Stitcher or Podbean. I don't think you can. Some of them you can't. That's the problem. Some of them you can't. Like Spotify, you can't leave a review. Uh, but yeah, it would be greatly appreciated if you if you could. Uh, we have, uh, well, since I'm talking about social media and all those kind of things, we have uh, a Facebook page and an Instagram page. Uh, the Facebook page is Podcast Into the Wilderness. And there's on that page, there's also a discussion group where a handful of uh, listeners uh just talk about things, talk about the shows. Uh, so if you want to join that, you're welcome to join that. And uh, Instagram is Pace underscore Brothers. Uh, we're starting to use Twitter a little bit more uh, because we're now uh, putting up shows uh, with the like, shorts from the shows and we're getting a bit of interaction on that. It was something we never thought we'd use, but it's actually, I think, quite useful for some. I'm using things. it as a news feed now. So uh, if you are on Twitter, you're more than welcome to uh, tweet tweet us and we will read it. Uh, we're not particularly fast at it, but we will read it and we'll re- reply back to you at some point. Uh, all of the information can be found on our website, which is the W's, the pacebrothers.com. And uh, yeah, if you want to email the show, message us or anything, then podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. All the links are always in the description of the show. So you shouldn't get lost. Uh, but yeah, enjoy. Uh, enjoy the sh- I hope you've enjoyed the show and we'll speak to you again in two weeks time. 
don't forget to enter the competition. And if you've been disappointed by not winning a Modern Huntsman, just go buy one. Go onto our website and go buy yourself one. And if you eventually win one with one of the competitions, you can always give it to a friend. Yes. And like we said, there's only six copies of Volume 2 left in the UK. Yeah. So once they're gone, it's going to be a wee while before we get them again. So just order now. Otherwise, you'll be disappointed and you'll be like the people that don't, didn't order Volume 1 when we told them to. <laughs> don't miss and out. And now are waiting. <laughs> yeah. Don't miss out. You'll hear from us in two weeks' time. <laughs>